Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. If we could please come to order. This is the December 17th, 2018, 7 p.m. meeting of Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Um, glad to see everybody here tonight. All five commissioners are present. So we'll ask Commissioner Lashley to please uh, lead us in the invocation and the pledge. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pause at this time to honor you. We thank you for, the, for sending your son Jesus to be born, walk on this earth as a man. We thank you for the Christian season that we can honor and worship the Son of the living God. And as we prepare to do the people's business, we ask for your guidance and wisdom. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Can I stand and join in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, next we have our public speakers. Um, I just want to take a quick moment to go over our public comment policy, which is available to be seen on our website. It was it's adopted as revised September 2014. The comment period is limited to a maximum of 30 minutes. Um, then there's the commissioner's response period immediately following the public comment period. Uh, each speaker during the public comment period has three minutes to speak. There shall be no more than three speakers on any one topic per meeting. So I'm looking at the list of speakers and I see um, there may be four um, who are here to speak about the same thing. So if the fourth person to speak on an issue is, uh, if your name is called, if you just want to say pass or whatever, that would be appreciated. Um, so, speakers address the board from the lectern at the front of the room, and please begin your remarks by stating your name and address. If at any time you are not able to make your <coughs> remarks, if you have them written, you can submit them to our clerk, and then they will be included in the minutes of the meeting. If anybody ha needs an accommodation, we're happy to do that. If somebody is viewing this on, on video, and you're thinking about coming to make a public comment at a commissioner meeting, if you'll please call the office then and let us know if you have a, a condition that needs accommodation. We're delighted to do everything we can to make that happen. Um, so with that being said, I mean there's other stuff in the policy, but I'm going to go read it to you. Uh, if you take the time to review it yourself, that would be great. Uh, also, one thing I do want to say though is that we have on the agenda tonight a public hearing for economic development incentives and if you're coming tonight to speak specifically about those economic development incentives uh, you don't need to use public comment time we will have and during the public hearing members of the public who want to address the board regarding those economic incentives will have a separate chance to do that so uh, you can hold off until then and then instead of getting three minutes, I think you get five, so even better. So with that being said, uh, the first speaker signed up is Michael Kennedy. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? Mike, good. Good. How are you? Good. All right. My name is Michael Kennedy. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for IC Solutions. We're based out of San Antonio, Texas, 2200 Danbury Street. I'm here to speak about item 8.3 on the agenda, I believe, which is the inmate telephone and video visitation services contract. Uh, we were, I believe the results were posted last Friday that ourselves and a, a competitor named Paytel, uh, a North Carolina-based company, the, uh, had, uh, the, the recommendation was going to be that uh, Paytel be awarded the contract. When we looked further into it, we noticed that during the evaluation scoring, we were tied, exactly. We were 93 points, I believe, each out of 100, and the nearest competitor was 76 points. So it was a significant uh, difference between one, two, and then obviously three. 
what we would like to, to do uh, is essentially ask the, the Commission to the table this award tonight until purchasing it's the opportunity to see the technology or at least ask for what we call a best and final or BAFO. And, and, uh, it's, it's very, very, very unusual for anybody in, in this marketplace, and I've been doing it since 1992, to tie. As a matter of fact, it's pretty unheard of, you know. And so we never heard from purchasing after the tie. Uh, we, we, matter of fact, we didn't know we tied until Friday when the results were posted. Uh, what typically happens, uh, and, and it gives essentially to make sure because we know, uh, I guess, your mission statement is to make sure it's fair and open to the vendors and we, you know, and all, all the, those wonderful magical words that we have. But essentially, w what typically happens when it's close is the, uh, uh, the uh, purchasing department will call in with subject matter experts, somebody from the facility, the sheriff's department, <coughs> IT, people from purchasing, obviously, and they allow either a demonstration, typically it takes about an hour, sometimes it can go longer. Uh, so they actually see the technology that's been written about in the RFP response. We have a we have a phrase: the paper refuses no ink, and so so kind of kind of fleshes out the you know the the creative writers in our marketplace, and so they, so we can prove that we can actually do what we say we can do. So either either they bring in a demonstration process and or they ask for a best and final offer among the two finalists, which would be us. And that's typically takes a couple of days, an email saying, hey, try to improve your offer. And guess what? It always improves. And so uh, so we would ask that you uh, you consider that before awarding uh, this. Uh, the fact that it's tied, very unusual. And, and we believe, obviously, our technology, we're a much bigger company than Paytel. I do know bigger is not always better. You know, but we're also a younger company. Our technology is, uh, has been placed in very, very large facilities. We have, uh, we have 44,000 inmates in one facility that we installed in 30 days, for example. So we have, the, we have the technical wherewithal to be able to handle and meet your needs. And I see I have two seconds left, so I'm done. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Kennedy. Thank you. All right, next on our list of public speakers is Donna Poe. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Donna Poe, and I live at 1907 Quake and Bush Road in Snow Camp, just a thousand yards from the proposed crust stone quarry, approved for construction in January this year without public awareness or input. We, the citizens of Snow Camp, have been told by the county attorney that the permit was in conformance with the conditions set forth in the Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance. This ordinance is flawed and needs to be revised. The permit was approved with only one set of eyes by a planning director who is no longer there. Even the chair of the planning department, Rodney Cheek, shared at the planning department meeting last Thursday his not knowing about the approved permit until he saw the same sign we all did posted at the Snow Camp store nine months after the rubber stamp approval. <coughs> Something is definitely wrong. We are hopeful the state permit will be denied as a result from our public hearing this past Wednesday because of the many risks and reasons why this mine should not happen. And we are very thankful to all of you, our elected county commissioners, for your participation in, in that requested said hearing. And we are especially thankful for the 500 folks that attended SAME, to the 40 articulate and amazing public comments, and subsequent 70 plus written comments sent to the hearing officer in which the, the deadline for the written comments was today. The positive side in all this has been the unity of our communities working together to stop this quarry. And we seek the opportunity to work with the county for an ordinance revision reflecting the ideals and mission, mission with, the, with the Alamance County Strategic Plan. It is also our request that a moratorium be placed on the current ordinance to allow the revision process and not let any other heavy industrial class four permits slip in during this revision process. We are thankful for the unanimous vote by the Planning Department this past Thursday to recommend to you, the County Commissioners, a vote for a moratorium. We only wish that we could have been a little timelier in our request and you could be voting on same this evening. Thank you again for your time and space to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Poe. Uh, next is Bill Poe. <coughs> Bill Poe. 1907 Quake and Bush Road, Snow Camp, North Carolina. And I was just going to speak on, uh, uh, after going to and being part of the, the planning uh, uh, meeting the other night, uh, I just like, I think I would like to see a broader spec of um, 
communication between planning uh, department, planning board, and obviously they, there was some miscommunication or non-communication, and then also with the, the, the county commissioners. It's bringing forth, uh, especially on heavy, you know, industrial ordinances and those sort of things that would affect uh, public safety and uh, you know, well-being of our uh, environment and our areas. Okay. That's all I've got. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Poe. Uh, Thomas Hicks. Good evening. I'm number three and number four, and that was an error. Uh, <laughs> my name is Thomas Hicks, and uh, I live at 1730 Quaken Bush Road in Snow County. <coughs> Recently, a group of uh, concerned citizens sent a letter to the county attorney requesting additional information regarding the permitting process for the crushed stone quarry located in Snow County. Because the letter was on an attorney's letterhead, the assumption was made that the group was planning litigation and the request for information was refused. The purpose of the letter was to encourage your assistance in establishing full transparency in the process that we used in issuing the permit. Nothing was intended to imply litigation. In the letter, we requested information and missing documents concerning whether or not specific county ordinances and regulations were followed. For example, the heavy industrial development ordinance was determined to be consistent with the Alamance County Land Development Plan. That plan contains a flood damage prevention ordinance which requires that any proposed development in a designated floodplains uh, obtain a flood development <coughs> permit. The proposed site has two FEMA designated floodplains located on the site. And our question is, did the county require the flood development permit as required by your ordinance? We don't know. The Alamance Land Development Plan also includes a watershed zoning ordinance, which was established to impose higher development standards on land located upstream of and draining into the drinking water supply that is generally imposed on other property. The proposed site contains two creeks, both of which drain into Cane Creek, the Hall River, and ultimately Jordan Lake, which are all major drinking water sources. One of the creeks, Reedy Creek Branch, is designated by the state as a WS5 upstream drinking water source. One of the types of development that is specifically prohibited in the watershed area is industry, and any proposed development in these areas require a plan be submitted to the watershed administrator. Our question, was that procedure followed? We can't tell from the file. We are so appreciative of everything that you have done uh, to date, including holding a special meeting to request a public hearing from the state and, um, and making arrangements for us to have a big old place out at uh, Sylvan Elementary School. But we are, we are asking the planning department to take a look at the heavy industrial development ordinance and, and declare a possible moratorium until modifications can be made. We would like to continue to working with you to resolve the discrepancies that we found in the permitting process for Snow Camp property investments. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. And I'm done. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <coughs> Henry Vine. Henry, how you doing? Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak at this public hearing. I have talked to each and every one of y'all personally uh, on the issue of the bonds and how we're going to pay for it. <coughs> I know uh, we voted overwhelmingly for these bonds at like 65, 67 percent, and we voted 45 to 55 percent not to impact, put a sales tax on. But 45 percent of us think that's the way to go. I think that the best way that we can fund this, other than a six cent increase or even more, because in essence, the, the debt that we're incurring is going to be $15 million debt load a year, if you figure on the whole 190000 at one time. I know we're doing this in a stage form, but we're looking at $15 million. If you break that down in property tax, that's a 10 cent 
That's 10 cent in order to, to accomplish that. Well, that's taking 10 cent off of the 59 cent, so that's 49 cent that this county's gonna have to operate on. We're operating on 59 cent now. So when we get there, I mean, where are we gonna go? We, it's, I know there's all different avenues that this comes from. We have an availability of, of a half cent uh, sales tax that we could ask our General Assembly to do. I know that a majority of the voters voted against the sales tax, but tonight I am appealing to the taxpayers. I wanted to take this opportunity for everybody that's listening on TV that's going to see this on video, reach out to these commissioners and tell them that you would rather have a sales tax than a property tax increase. This is the most fairest way we can accomplish this. I don't think that people understood what we were saying. You said you wanted it, but you ain't giving no way to pay for it. So I, I'm pleading to the public tonight to call each and every one of y'all. I know you don't want to hear that. <laughs> email or, 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 or email, and those numbers are available on the website. And if you can't get them, call me. I got them. I appreciate your time and the consideration on this. This is something that we've all got to work together and try to come up with a, the best solution. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Thank you Henry. Thank you, Henry. <coughs> All right, that closes our public comment time. Do we have any commissioner responses? Well, I do. I've got <clears throat> three points I want to uh, ask about. Number one, did we ever hear from Colonial Pipeline? No, we have not. I think uh, they had indicated once they made their comments to the state, they would then share a copy with the county also. I've heard it three times. Mm -hmm. and, and anybody from the group that's here, that have y'all heard from Colonial? We know that they submitted a written comment to the state, and we have not received a copy of it. I have requested a copy for, directly from the state. Um, mm -hmm. But, but you're sure it's gone? But we do know that they did, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we don't have a copy of it, right? No. no. Okay, see if we can get a copy of that. Of course. Uh, <clears throat> now, quick question on the jail. You remember the old jail that, uh, not, not, uh, Massey or you, but uh, Stalker. Oh, yeah, yeah, Stalker. Oh, Lord, yeah. Stalker. Yeah, a little like the Alamo. Mm -hmm. Did they put that on a ballot to to build a new one, and that was rejected? If you go back far enough. Yes, sir. I think it is, but we we're doing the history. Right. Right. If I'm not mistaken, that was put on a ballot, rejected, and in county still did it because they had to do it. Okay. All right. So if we can find out more about that, I appreciate that. We've got the history over there, and I'll get it to you. Yeah, and uh, vote totals, if we can <laughs> find that out, the whole, whole nine yards. Because best of my memory, it was rejected, and, and it's it the county still built it. Because <clears throat> I remember the old one. God, I'm oh. <laughs> that old. Okay, and uh, on the uh, state legislature, as far as the sales tax, uh, if, if special legislation went through, is that feasible? Well, we have... Uh, the county currently has two options for sales tax that uh, both require voter referendum. Um, and so at this point, we don't have any other option. I know there's been a lot of questions asked uh, about the possibility of the commissioners at right now at this time just saying we're going to institute a new sales tax. We, we can't. We've maxed out what we're allowed to do without the voter referendum. Um, I've understood, I think, some conversations with Mr. Vines that there could be uh, the possibility of a request from this board to our delegates. Uh, for the possibility of some kind of local act special to Alamance County that might would allow the uh, institution of a sales tax. I, I don't know what the feasibility of that would be. Is that a legal lo local uh, bill? Is that what it would be introduced at? I think that's that's the conversation some folks have uh, brought up. So. Now, I asked that we write our representatives and ask, was that feasible? Did we do that? No, we have not. Okay, why not? Why not? Just have not, but I will write them and okay. find out. All right, because I asked about a week right. ago, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm sorry I had to ask these questions, but sure. okay, I'm sorry. Mr. Sutton, I'll tell you that um, I called um, one of our representatives and I haven't spoken to him about it, but okay. I reached out myself and asked. Because if I'm not mistaken, Henry, you talked to Riddell, didn't you? Yes, sir. Okay. I talked to Dennis and uh, I got a phone call back. 
and uh, you check with the council of government, there's a half cent available down in this county. There's a two and a half cent cap on all counties of sales tax. There's a half cent still available that has to go through and it would have to be initiated on a local bill that they would introduce into legislation. First of all, what would have to be was a, a unified resolution by you five commissioners asking them to impose that half cent sales tax to our next county. Once they receive that from you, or or or, 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 or if, whatever you just yeah. up yeah. to a half cent, right? You know, up to a half. Half is is the limit. You can't go no higher. That's it. Two and a half cent is the cap, and uh, then it would be uh, up to them to put the bill in, and if all of those are in agreement. It's just a matter of formality going through the uh, uh, through the uh, process of being introduced. They speak to it, and then it goes to the floor for a vote. We've we've done some something similar to that on a coyote bill that we've introduced and got put through on a local bill, spoke to, and went through that helped let us uh, be able to trap coyotes and everything in Alamance County. It's just Alamance County. It don't affect any other counties. It's just our county. Well, let's find out what we can do. Yeah. Is that all, Mr. Uh, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the litigation, Clyde, can you clarify that to us, sir? With uh, folks that sent the letter to you? Yes, their attorney uh, wrote me a letter mailed it about a week and a half after she sent it to you folks, I think. She emailed it to everybody but me. I responded to her letter. And uh, she asked a set of interrogatories, which I'm not going to answer. Um, we gave her the public records that we had. Somebody came and got them. may have been from the Snow Camp group. And uh, in her letter, she indicated there was no permit granted, but clearly there's a permit in there stamped approved. Apparently. The records were shuffled, and she's not able to put page one with page two and page three. But we have complied with their public records request, <clears throat> but we're not obligated to answer interrogatories. And generally, when I get a letter from an outside attorney, you unless it's company that. with a summons and a complaint, I'm not going to answer interrogatories. Okay. Just want to know for the record yes. what that was. All right. If not, then we will move on to approval of the agenda. <clears throat> I move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval of the agenda. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Anyone opposed? Then we have uh, some items listed on our consent agenda. Um, if everyone is reviewed that if um there's nothing to pull out or any concerns move to approve thank you did you make a motion yeah i'll yeah. second it thank you we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda is there any discussion if not all in favor please say aye aye, aye. anyone opposed thank you all right next we have the public hearing regarding economic incentives for Beckton Dickinson and Company. Um, we will need a vote to open. I will make a motion hearing. that we go into a public hearing. Yes, so for a second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to open the public hearing regarding economic development incentives for Beckton Dickinson and Company. All in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Uh -huh. Anyone opposed? All right. So now we have started our public hearing, and I will ask if anybody on this side of the room to my left, if there is anybody who wishes to be heard regarding economic development incentives for the company, Becton Dickinson and Company. Is there anybody who wants to be heard? All right, I don't see anybody. How about on this side of the room? Does anybody over here want to be heard on uh, economic incentives for that company? Mr. Vine, come on up. Nobody else wants to talk. Henry, what does that mean? While you're getting yourself ready, Henry, uh, is there anybody in the overflow room? Could you, is there anybody in there? 
It wants to talk. The, yeah, there's, if there are people in the overflow room. If y'all could ask if anybody wants to be heard on the incentives. If they come on in here, that would be great. All right, go ahead, Henry. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you again for allowing uh, this comment period. I wish we could have heard from the company first so that we kind of could get a little more specific information before we make our comments. But uh, I, I've got, uh, I've talked to a lot of people and I've got a lot of information from from, from some of y'all and then uh, I think I, I know where we're at. Uh, I just think it's time that uh, we need to say no to incentives here in Alamance County. We do a lot of first things here in Alamance County and I think that uh, it's time that we quit being held hostage and paying a ransom to get people to come to our good community. Uh, this company is probably a real good company. There's nothing wrong with this company. I see nothing that's, that says they're wrong. They're a company that's established here. I would think that they would want to be a good neighbor and just operate here and expand, which is going to be lucrative to them, or they wouldn't, they wouldn't be looking at this expansion. This $175 million investment that they're talking about would equal, if they done it all at one time and was paying taxes on the $176 million, at, at $1 million of, of <coughs> property tax that would be generated into our general fund. Now we all are facing, as I just talked about, we're facing this bond issue and we're facing six plus cent property tax increase. Their contribution to, to the taxes at a million dollars would, uh, of a million dollars, would it be equivalent on the, the whole county of three quarter cent? So that could be three quarter cent less that you would have to charge all the citizens of Alamance County. There's been discussion that it doesn't cost us anything, but it does cost us as citizens because when we've got needs and the money's not there, then we're the ones that's got to make up the difference of that three quarter cent. I understand that these are really good paying jobs and that's good that they're coming with good paying jobs because a lot of them that we've been getting haven't been good paying jobs. But we also have another company right now that's locating in our area, PRA. I don't think their investment is quite as much, like 17 million is what I've been told. They're looking at 500 employees at 40 plus thousand dollars a year. They ain't asked for a dime. That's gonna be a pretty good help to this, to this community. Also, we have businesses coming in here every day. We have new housing developments. We have new apartment complexes building on our tax base to help with this. And all of us are paying our taxes. I just think that these other companies and stuff should have to pay their taxes just like I do. I'm helping pay for my way and I think they will be paying for their way. The other thing is, you know, if we look at this in the past, we need, to, we need the jobs here in Alamance County. We need jobs, you know. Well, we always would like to see jobs coming in. But our unemployment now is as low as it's ever been, at 2.9%. So it's not like we need to bribe anybody to come here so we can get some jobs for people that don't have a job. And I think a lot of these jobs that'll be coming may or may not even live here. They may be commuting from other counties <coughs> into our county. Revenues may or may not be coming in here. They, you know, they may live in Chatham County or Caswell County, whatever. Uh, I just think that I'd like to see this company come in here and I'd like to see them make this investment. They're already here. I would. I would think they would want to stay here and be good, good neighbors and help with our, our schools, our technical college, in which they're probably going to take advantage of getting training and stuff. I understand there's engineers uh, involved in this. There's other different higher level positions. 
But I just say I'm I'm speaking out against it, and I I would like for y'all to take a stand and say no for one time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Henry. All right. Is there anybody else who wishes to be heard? Come on up. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Sam Moser. I didn't want to disappoint you all for not coming up and speaking against incentives. But, um, At least I'm not as lonely as I usually am. <laughs> didn't want to disappoint anybody. I want to thank each of you for your service. I know you have a lot of hard work, a lot of tough decisions to make, and I thank you for it. Uh, you've got a lot of hard work ahead of you. The $189 million bond that we're going to figure out how to pay for. I want to echo what Mr. Henry Vine says. If there's alternative ways other than taxing property owners, let's please try to look at that. Uh, we've got Beck, Beckton Dixon Company asking for incentives. I think it's $2.6 million, something to that effect. I'm not quite sure. I read that in the newspaper. Um, we've heard, we've read in newspapers for years incentives could be considered uh, corporate bribery, corporate extortion. I've heard that from some of our county commissioners. I've heard that from some of our legislators. Uh, I'm not saying this is corporate bribery we're going to hear about this afternoon. I don't know that. I might say that it may appear to be corporate bribery. I'm just not sure. But I did read that I think the company is talking about possibly moving to Sumter, South Carolina, and maybe, was it Broken Bay, Nebraska? Is it Broken Bay, Nebraska? I did some research. If that's if that's a talk about moving to Nebraska, that little town has 3,548 uh, citizens. Nebraska has a population of 1 million, 1.92 million. South Carolina has a population of 5.24 million. North Carolina has a population of 10.27 million. I would think a company doing business with the population, and we're talking about medical supplies, you would want to be in a state that had 10.27 million. That's just my thinking. I would certainly want D&B to continue business in Alamance County. Obviously, great, great company. We would want them to continue showing support for our employees who have helped make them successful. However, I would like to ask this company to expand without taking $2.6 million in revenue from our county. <clears throat> revenue that could be used to help pay our county employees, help maintain our uh, infrastructure, help pay our firemen and law enforcement. Revenue that could help support our schools and our young kids in school. To our commissioners, I would like to ask, ask, I would like to say, ask not what your commission seat can do for you or for big business. Ask what you can do for your Alamance County citizens, your children, your grandchildren. Ask what you can do for our future generations. If corporate, continue, corporate incentives continue, if they continue sharing less and less of tax responsibility, taxpayers will have to make up the difference. I would ask each of you join a cause for a greater human fairness. When you vote, vote fairness for all of your citizens, all of our small business people, just please vote no on these incentives. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Mr. Moses. <coughs> Is there anybody else who wants to be heard? 
during the public hearing. Make a motion that we close the public hearing. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. I think uh, Mac Williams, are you going to uh, introduce the agreement for economic incentives? Well, good evening, commissioners and uh, members of the public. I'm Mac Williams. I'm president of the Alamance Chamber. Uh, and in that capacity, I also serve as the county's economic development person. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of the last couple of months of working with our uh, folks with uh, Beckton Dickinson in their Mebbin facility for a proposed expansion of that facility. <coughs> <coughs> okay, all right. Uh, and so, uh, having uh, heard uh, the comments, uh, I'm here to introduce to you a representative of the company to, to be more descriptive about exactly what it is that they're proposing to do. Uh, and he can answer all the questions about the facility, the, the jobs, the wages, the investment, and that sort of thing. Uh, this is an investment over a five-year period. The 175 is over a five-year period, as well as, as the jobs. Uh, and so uh, I would just say that the, the incentives, they, they, they are there, they are out there, but they're also short-term. Uh, there's a limited time frame where those incentives take effect and then 100% of what the company would be paying in property taxes goes to the county. And I, I would also add that the incentives are performance-based, meaning that the, what the company says they're going to do has to be done and taxes paid on it before the incentives are paid back out. And so it's not as if they aren't paying the taxes, they are paying their taxes but then the incentive is some of that tax money back in the form, form of a grant. So just to make that point clear, that it is performance-based. So without further ado, we've got two gentlemen here uh, representing the company. Chris Houghton is a, come on up, Chris, is a director for the company, and he kind of oversees for Beckton Dickinson. He shuffles the chess pieces around on the chessboard. That's the best way I can describe it. Good enough. <laughs> okay, good enough. Uh, and then also, uh, Paul Kuntz is a local attorney uh, who has been engaged to help them with the incentive agreement, which is also on your agenda to uh, look at. That's actually what you're actually voting on is the terms and conditions that are stated in the agreement. So Paul's here to help with any discussion or question that might be going on about that. So without further ado, Chris Halton, he can describe the project. Thank you, Mac. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity tonight uh, to speak to you, give you a little bit more information about uh, BD or Becton Dickinson, about the project in particular, and answer any questions you may have. So again, my name is Chris Houghton. I am responsible for moving the pieces around. Um, my job is operation strategy for BD or Becton Dickinson uh, for about a third of the company overall. Uh, and my job is really to identify where we should manufacture what around the world, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So without further ado, uh, who is BD? BD is a large uh, multinational corporation, and at, at our heart, we are a manufacturing company. Um, so overall, we have about 65,000 employees globally. About 40,000 of them are focused on manufacturing activities. So it is what we do. We're a technology company, but we're mainly a manufacturing company. Um, we have over 70 uh, manufacturing sites worldwide uh, registered uh, with the FDA, that is uh, manufacturing components for sale in the United States. Getting a little bit more specific, focusing here in North Carolina because BD has a long history of operating in North Carolina in particular. Uh, we do operate currently uh, here in Mebane in Alamance County, actually I spent 15 years of uh, my life growing up working in that plant, running that plant. Uh, between Burlington and Mebane, so uh, have a lot at stake here as well. Um, the Mebane site is a manufacturing plant for a cancer diagnostic business, which uh, the business itself is headquartered in our uh, Durham office, which is the second star up on the map. So operations are in Mebane, the business itself is headquartered in Durham, 
And then the largest of the sites is in RTP, uh, just down the road from the Durham site. It is actually the global R&D headquarters for BD as a whole, the entire company. Um, really doing the innovative development of new technologies that we don't know exactly what they'll be used for yet, not a product, concepts and technologies that we figure out how they're going to work uh, to make patients' lives better later on. Um, and then the fourth site, uh, which thank you very much, is in Four Oaks. Um, it is a distribution center used by BD globally. Um, so uh, distribution all up and down the east coast of the United States. So significant uh, representation, over 600 employees currently for BD across these four locations. If we look at BD as a whole, again, it's a big kind of complicated company, even for those of us who are kind of embedded in it fairly deeply. I'm going to focus on a third of the company, which is what our focus is here tonight, um, because BD is split into three major segments, life sciences, medical, and interventional. The medical side, just to hit on it, really it's sharp pointy things. Every time you get a shot, every time somebody sticks a needle in your arm, we probably made it in our medical segment. So it's really syringes uh, to do injections. The interventional side is for more long-term care. It can be for chemotherapy. Uh, it can be for um, colostomy bags, anything like that, which is really going to be a port, a catheter that's installed for long-term use. Our interventional side will handle that. My part of the business is life sciences, which includes diagnostic <coughs> systems, biosciences, and pre-analytical systems. So that's where we're going to focus. Within diagnostic systems, the Mebin and Durham sites that we, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, are within diagnostic systems. It's really where we are doing diagnostics for anything that a patient may have. And this is anything from a hospital-acquired infection to strep and flu to cancer diagnostics to sepsis if you're deeply sick and they don't know why, uh, test for bloodborne infections. So really, any time a patient presents with almost anything, we have a test for it, and our diagnostic systems business is focused on that. Uh, the next uh, piece of it is biosciences, which is a little bit more on the research end, uh, doing a lot of things with the NIH, doing a lot of things with universities, uh, doing some developmental diagnostics and just pure research with some of those institutions. And then finally, pre-analytical systems, which is the part that we're targeting for potential expansion uh, in Mebane. I'll go into that a little bit more. So pre-analytical systems overall, uh, the easiest way to think about it is when you go to <coughs> donate blood, or if you go to the doctor, you're sick and they need to take a blood sample or a sample from any other part of your body, but mostly it's blood samples, uh, both the port that they put into your vein and the collection tube that they attach to it uh, are made by pre-analytical systems. It's pre-analytical, so it's prior to us doing the diagnostics, they're doing the sample collection itself. Um, so that includes uh, vacutainer tubes, which we're all aware of. They plug in and they pull your, uh, the blood out of your body and keep it in a preservative for later diagnostics. So we serve customers around the world out of PAS. There are hospitals, laboratories, blood banks, public health agencies. Everybody uses this technology on an, a daily basis millions and millions of times. Um, the biggest thing, can you tap back again, please? Okay. Um, the biggest thing that we are focusing on now within pre-analytical analytical systems is trying to improve uh, the comfort of the stick when we put the needle in your, uh, in your vein and also healthcare worker safety because one of the major issues uh, is accidental needle sticks after the sample has been taken. The healthcare worker can inadvertently stick themselves and then they're exposed to bloodborne pathogens from that patient. The newest technology that we're planning to uh, put in uh, Mebane, if all goes according to plan, is it's called a push button device where you put the needle into your arm, you push a button, and the needle automatically retracts into the housing, and it is no longer available for uh, the healthcare worker to accidentally stick themselves. So it's both more comfortable and it reduces or eliminates the risk of an accidental stick. So it's really uh, focused on improving patient uh, safety, patient comfort, and healthcare worker safety is really where we're going. So looking at the architecture, these gentlemen did talk accurately about where we have uh, the sites that are under consideration. I do want to clarify we're not considering relocating existing operations from Mebane to these sites, just to be clear. So the Mebane operation 
is intact and is secure. What we're looking at is potentially where to put uh, the next pre-analytical system lines as we need to grow within this business. Where they operate today is in Sumter, South Carolina and Broken Bone, Nebraska, as the gentleman described, plus Plymouth in the UK. What we are looking for now is where we're going to put our additional lines as we continue to grow this around the world. And that's where Mevin starts to come in. Sumter and Broken Bow are already large plants. They already manufacture this product. And our decision is between growing them further or having Mevin become another site where we're manufacturing this technology. Um, and that's where we would like to go. But Sumter does obviously offer a significant number of economic advantages due to scale. And those are some of the things that we are trying to overcome here by starting up a new site. And that's the reason for uh, the application and engaging with you. A little more detail and information about Mebin uh, itself, our manufacturing site that we have. Again, our focus is on cancer diagnostics, uh, specifically cervical cancer uh, that women present with. So we manufacture uh, both sample collection as well as all of the diagnostic reagents and disposables that are required to do high quality, high efficiency testing uh, with a very low level of um, indeterminate results, which can result in a patient coming back for a repeat. So our technology is very accurate. It is also, uh, it minimizes the risk of a patient needing to come back. So we manufacture the collection, stains, reagents, and kits with all of that put together. The site itself today has about 83 full-time employees. Uh, the building is 100,000 square feet in size as it is. We built out about 60,000 of that, and that's what's in use today. That leaves us with about 40,000 square feet that's available, and that's what we would target uh, to bring these new pre-analytical systems lines into before we would need to expand, which we would need to do within the next couple of years, because we'd need to go significantly beyond this 100,000 square feet. So getting to that piece in a little more detail, so on the left is a blow up of the site itself showing what we have built out in white, the available space in green. On the east side of the building, we can expand by an additional 50,000 square feet if we choose to. It's a prepared pad that's easy for us to expand on. And in addition, when we purchased this site back in 2009, we purchased the eight acres next door with the expectation that we might want to expand one day. So the eight acres next door are available, and that's more likely the direction that we would be expanding within this five-year window, should we choose to go this direction. So the project scope itself uh, would be for up to eight new production lines. These are highly automated, highly advanced production lines, um, not manually moving things around, not manual packaging. It is automated assembly in a very technically complicated way. I've seen the lines run previously, and they kind of look like magic to me. Um, it is, so that's why we have, uh, like the gentleman we're referring to, a very high investment, but not as high a headcount higher as you would expect in some uh, operations, because it is highly automated with a lot of focus on electromechanical expertise to keep manufacturing lines running as opposed to manual assembly. So very high skill sets required to run this operation. Um, out of the 116 full-time employees we're targeting to hire, about half of them are salary professional, and about half of them are uh, direct labor. And the average salary, as mentioned, is about $65,000 per year. Um, on the low end, it can be in the, uh, toward 40, 50, um, and then obviously the salary professional, highly skilled engineering can go higher than that. Um, I mentioned the potential to expand the facility. It could go as large as 300,000 square feet of new manufacturing space, taking us up to about 400,000 uh, square feet in total when we are done, with the $176 million in total investment previously referred to. So I'll just open it up to questions from the commissioners in Let particular. Let me ask you is this. Yes, sir. Is uh, Ellis Cummings uh, traded on the stock market? Yes, sir. Okay, it's public. Yes, sir. Okay. Helps me. <coughs> how, how much capital, I mean, you're put, not putting a lot of square footage on the ground. Correct. As the machinery is where the correct. money is. That is correct. And I guess my biggest question is, is 
how, how does that work in our formula as far as depreciation on machinery? So uh, companies planning to do uh, investment of up to seventy million six hundred thousand dollars in real property, personal property of up to one hundred five million four hundred thousand uh, total investment potential. When we run our numbers on uh, our formulas on those numbers, we build in a ten percent depreciation on the per personal year. property. Yes, so uh, we're figuring our cash flow <laughs> based on depreciation of the company's. Uh, so uh, you machine. calculated that into mm -hmm. these numbers. Yes. yes. Do you have any competitors uh, locally in the region here or Research Triangle Park or what? They do the same thing you do? For these specific products, not that I am aware of. Anything close? I'm trying to think of the closest competitor. I believe that we have a competitor in the syringe area mm -hmm. in western North Carolina. As far as diagnos diagnostics. Uh, excuse me? Uh, it might be. Yes, sir. Um, in the diagnostics area, um, BMR U is in Durham, and they are a competitor in the diagnostic space. What about LabCorp? Uh, LabCorp is actually a customer of ours. They don't compete with us as much right. as they purchase our, uh, our equipment, our mm -hmm. uh, diagnostic equipment, and the tests themselves, and then they run them. So they're one of our large customers. And everything you have out there in Mevin, you've purchased. You're not leasing any of the property or buildings. Is that correct? That is correct. We were previously in a lease site in Burlington and moved into the Mevin site, which is fully owned. Okay. Last question. Uh, did you receive incentives for the first development part? Not that I am aware of. Did we? No. Did they ask? No, I don't believe so. There was a discussion about it, but uh, that didn't come to the board. You have 40,000 square feet in the existing facility. How much do you plan, how many square feet do you plan for the eight acre site? It would be about 300,000 square feet added on, and it would span across uh, from the existing building, basically add on to it in stages? and occupy some of that 300,000. In stages? It, may, it might be one build at one time to build the shell, or it could be done in stages. That detail is not done okay. yet. And Mevin has already granted your request, is that correct? They approved them recently, yes, sir. Y'all got any products tonight? I'm waiting for you, and you got a few. I don't, I don't have any <laughs> questions myself. I mean, if, uh, I guess if y'all know what to do, if we want to make a motion to approve the agreement. Mm -hmm. I'll make the motion we approve the agreement. Second that. 116 jobs is hard to come by. At those there wages. Were high paying jobs. Yes. Good paying jobs, that's right. Okay, wait. Before we a vote, may I, have, may I make a comment? Of or course. Is that in the. In yeah. the Go uh, for it. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I wish you'd caught my wife's cancer. Uh, so I have no, nothing but compliments to people who are trying to help our health care industry. Uh, philosophically, I'm diametrically opposed to incentives. Uh, I voted no for years, and I'm going to continue to vote no. Uh, it, and the only points I've ever tried to make on this is against the law to waive your taxes. Tax abatements. It's against the law but we can give you cash. Now, there's something wrong with that formula. Uh, and I'll always stand on that ground. Steve's been in banking, I've been in banking, and a banker would go to jail for going to a client and saying, give me your payroll, I'll give you 10% or 5% or 3%, or I'll give you 10,000, you can go to the beach with it, whatever. They'd go to jail. But it's okay for government to do it. There's something wrong with that. Uh, this board years ago voted a resolution and sent it to Raleigh to ask the state legislature to take us out of the bidding wars. High Point and Greensboro got into it. We don't want to bid against each other. You know, take us out of it, please. Let's let's come to agree an agreement that will neutralize and 
be neutral on this. And uh, so we, we sent it to the state. Didn't do any good, I mean, but at least it, it was lip service from this board, and then the board kept voting for us. <laughs> well, at least and we the, did and that. The state's busy doing this. Yeah, thing. so I'm not <laughs> mad at anybody who votes for them. It's just it, I don't understand the logic. Never have. Uh, I did. I voted for them at one time, and then when I saw that uh, uh, who was it, Sheets or somebody was trying to get the contractor was trying to get incentives for Sheets in Guilford County, I said, "Okay, that's it. I've had it. I've had it. No more." And uh, so I vote no, and uh, but no offense, I, I don't. I'm not mad at anybody, and uh, I hope someday the government will take us out of it. If the state wants to give them, fine. But uh, it's hard to debate in my mind the fact that we can't waive your taxes, but we can give you cash. There's something wrong with it, and I'll stand on that. So I'm ready to vote. <clears throat> okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is a presentation by the Alamance Burlington School System about the budget for fiscal year 1819, so the one that we are currently enjoying. Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening and share an update on our 2018-19 uh, school budget. Uh, we understand we have a responsibility to be good stewards of the financial resources that are made available to us locally at the state and federal level, and a big part of that is being transparent, and that's, that's part of the reason that we're here this evening, to share where we are with revenues across all of those revenue uh, sources, including uh, grant funds, and then taking a look at where those dollars are going to go, um, which I'm sure you're aware the overwhelming majority will go into salary and benefits for, for folks that work in the, for, in the school system. The, um, the relationship between a school board and superintendent are really critical in terms of advancing uh, school systems, improving outcomes, making sure we're doing a good job in, in allocating our resources. Um, right behind that, though, is the relationship um, between uh, the superintendent and the chief financial officer. And uh, the chief financial officer, uh, I'm real pleased to introduce this evening for Elements Burlington School System, is Mr. Jeremy Teeter. He was one of the first hires that I um, had, had the opportunity to, um, to make in coming to Elements Burlington. And uh, I um, have been very impressed with his diligence and already identifying areas in which we think we could um, get some improvement from both processes and, and perhaps in terms of uh, allocation of those resources. We also very much looking, are looking forward to working with you all closely uh, on lots of different issues. Um, we've heard a little bit about one of those tonight, and that is the bond and the, as far as the school system goes and the capital improvements that those will bring about and how it is that we're going to uh, finance and, and, and pay for that building. So we're looking forward to working closely with you all and making that happen as well. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Teeter, and uh, he is our numbers guy, and he's got some details for you. And if there's anything else that I can respond to at, at the closure of his remarks, I'd be happy to try and do that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chair Gailey and Commissioners. Uh, it's good to be in front of you this evening. It's a different context than it has been in the past, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity uh, to present to you. Um, so uh, first, we just wanted to start uh, by putting our revenues in front of you. Um, as you can see uh, from that chart, uh, we're very much a state-dependent uh, entity, as you would expect. Uh, but we, we certainly uh, do not dismiss the level of funding that we have received from you this year. Uh, you were very generous um, in, in honoring our continuation request for the 18-19 school year, um, and that has played a critical role in our ability uh, to continue to do business as normal and not have to make tough choices this year. Uh, so, again, we appreciate you uh, in that respect. Uh, we do, as, as, as most school systems in North Carolina, uh, receive a number of federal grants uh, that we manage. Um, and we'll, we'll get into more details on all these funding sources here shortly. Uh, we do also receive capital funding in which you are a part of. And again, we appreciate the million dollars uh, from local dollars that you sent our way this year in order to take care of our critical projects. Uh, we do have two uh, enterprise funds that are a part of our operations. Uh, we manage a child nutrition program, which is one of the few 
um, in North Carolina that's self-sufficient, so we're not having to provide state or local dollars to make it operate. It turns a profit on its own. I um, mean, we do operate a profitable daycare program uh, that ultimately generates additional dollars that we're able to push back into those schools. We're also fortunate for the community that we live in, Alamance County. Uh, we have a number of generous foundations and individuals who uh, who go into their pockets to provide us resources to make things happen and to help us satisfy uh, special needs. And so um, over $7 million this year anticipated um, in grant uh, sources and donations from the community. Um, so the first, uh, the first item that I'll touch on are the state funds. Um, and so as Dr. Benson alluded to, uh, we do use the state dollars to primarily pay benefits, salaries and benefits. And so we're looking at teachers, uh, looking at school administration, um, support staff, teaching assistants, and we'll get into more detail on that here shortly on, on how we're breaking out that staffing with those dollars. But as you can see, the lion's share of that money is indeed going to support our staffing. <coughs> Uh, the next uh, category of interest um, are the local dollars, um, and this is an area in which, A, as I said, we, we appreciate you providing the dollars you have provided, and then two, the county has always worked very well with the school system in giving us flexibility with managing those dollars. Uh, the, the state of North Carolina and our federal programs provide very complex rules. Uh, we're only one of seven uh, states in the country that are funded the way we are with state dollars. And so sometimes it makes it difficult to piece that puzzle together. And the local dollars play a very large role in our ability to make things happen uh, quickly and easily uh, when we're building a budget. Uh, we still do have um, a healthy share of salary and benefits that come from these dollars. Uh, but we also use the money that you give us to take care of facilities, keep the lights on, um, as well as um, providing the instructional supplies uh, that, that get directly into the hands of our teachers and students every day. Um, and again, we will uh, get more into details on that here shortly. Uh, federal funds, again, uh, you know, you see the trend here, salary and benefits is another large share there. Uh, some of the major federal programs there are intended to provide additional support to our schools uh, that are in communities with, uh, with the majority of the students who are on free and reduced lunch. So our lowest income <coughs> students uh, benefit from some of these federal programs. Uh, these programs also benefit our children who have severe learning deficiencies or have severe handicaps. And these programs provide us the additional resources we need uh, to meet their needs and give them the equal education uh, that other students might otherwise uh, receive. Um, and so you'll notice, it may seem kind of strange, you'll see there we have a line item on there that says capital outlay. Uh, and so those, in, in, the, in every instance there where you'll see a capital outlay expense, that means that those programs have purchased a piece of equipment that's greater, in fi greater than $500 in value. And so we may have some students who require specialized equipment. And so those are our efforts to meet their needs. Jeremy, before you move on, I yes, have a question. You mentioned free and reduced lunches. Uh, can you expound on that just a moment? Is, is that uh, item up there on the board? Um, so we do not have specific data in the presentation about the percentage, but we do know 68% uh, of students in Alamance Burlington schools right now qualify for free or reduced lunch. Uh, and so the federal government looks at those numbers to drive how much additional support we might receive to benefit those students. Uh, so they recognize that uh, we may have additional challenges meeting the needs of those students. Um, and so 68% <coughs> is significant. Um, and so uh, we find elementary level, it tends to be higher. Middle, it drops off a little bit. And then high school, it drops off further. And we're, we find that you know, the students are maybe embarrassed to turn in the application for free or reduced lunch. And, and we see a fall off uh, in that. Uh, some of our schools, uh, you know, the degree of poverty is so high that uh, they, every student in the building automatically qualifies without having to actually apply for the benefit. Is there a dollar figure that comes in that's um, beyond the cost of the actual lunch? There is not. So when we, our child nutrition program completes a reimbursement process, and so we share with them the number of meals that were served at the, at the set breakfast or lunch rate, and then they reimburse us a month in arrears uh, for those dollars. So it's actually, you bill them, they pay it. But, yes, sir. But there's no, nothing left over. Correct. Okay. Uh, so uh, the grant funds uh, is another area of interest, and so uh, we do we do pay for some personnel out of those grant dollars. Our pre-K program is is managed through uh, the grant fund. Uh, we receive money specifically from the state of North Carolina that passes through uh, the Partnership for Children. Then it drops down to us, and we send them a bill each month. 
we tell them how many kids we have in the program and they pay us that rate. Uh, this is an interesting uh, note for the public in that uh, some of your lottery dollars go to support those pre-K programs and so that does not come up in conversation a lot. Uh, we only think about construction sometimes, uh, but pre-K programs in North Carolina are supported by lottery dollars. Um, and we do see um, a lot of supplies there um, in this particular category. Uh, we were fortunate to get support uh, for, for new playgrounds at some of our schools uh, that we might otherwise uh, not be able to put in place. <clears throat> and so now we get into uh, a little more topic of interest here. We're starting to break down these individual funds. Uh, and so if you're looking at all, so this is looking at our state, uh, local, federal, um, in our grant funds, uh, you can see that teachers uh, constitute the largest share of the dollars that we're spending on employees. Uh, and then school administrators are, are right behind that. Um, and then the instructional support like teaching assistance. Uh, supplementary pay um, is a large category there and those are the local dollars that you all share with us in order to pay competitive wages for our teachers. Uh, one line also that is often of interest in the public um, and, it, and it has been in both school systems that I've worked in now is the central office administration. Um, and so our central office uh, compensation is just a little over 1% of our total budget. Uh, and so, um, you know, I spend a lot of time comparing the system I'm in now to the smaller system that I came from. Um, and here in Alamance, we have a grand total of 32 folks who you would consider a coordinator, a director, an assistant director, or an assistant super of some variety. Uh, and so we've got 36 schools that those folks are serving. Um, and in Caswell, we have six schools, uh, we have 10 of those folks. And so if you kind of draw that to scale, you know, and if you, if you carry that same train of thought here, we really don't have a lot when you scale us up to, to smaller counties. And so we try to be, we try to be mindful of that. Uh, you know, we're keenly, keenly aware of public perception and we work hard to minimize uh, what we have going on at central office. Um, and I will say also related to that, uh, you know, we're in a unique position where you have the superintendency and the CFO positions have changed hands at the same time. And so we're asking a lot of tough questions at central office about, you know, what are you doing? What's your function? How are you contributing to outcomes for children? So we're looking at everything very carefully. Um, and so I know Dr. Benson has already been busy reorganizing things at central office to, to take what we have and make it do even more for kids. Um, uh, the next category, um, so this just breaks it down further to say, okay, let's take uh, these salaries and benefits. How much local money um, are, we, are we putting towards those salaries and benefits uh, and what kind of employees are we funding? And so again, kind of going back to that central office dollar, it's 765000 from local. Uh, we get about, and you'll see this in just a moment, about $1.1 million from the state specifically for central office and they give us so as I, I talked about sort of their rules and allotments, we get 1.1 million from them where they say, hey, you have to spend this on folks who work at central office. So we exhaust those dollars uh, and then we're spending a, a fairly small amount above and beyond what we get from the state. Uh, another challenge we've had with the state and central office administration is that over the last two years, uh, the state has reduced funding for those positions by 11.6%. So that's that shifted a little more burden to the local side of things to keep folks in place at central office. Um, another area that we're particularly proud of with our local dollars is the amount of money we're spending on workers comp. Uh, so uh, when I came on board in July, I was a little taken aback just being fully transparent on what we were spending on workers comp. Uh, and so we um, so we've, we've done a couple of things. Uh, so one, we've already seen a $104,000 reduction in what we're spending in that area. Part of that was uh, challenging the way our workers' comp provider was assessing our risk or, or assessing um, the, ca the calculation of the premium. And so uh, they were including some contracted services in there that should not have been in there. Uh, we had, so that was the responsibility of the contractors to take care of workers' comp and not ours. Uh, so we saw that savings right off the bat. Uh, and we're also now working with folks uh, who have, um, or departments that have, have a lot of occurrences of workers' comp claims to drive those down. And so, you know, that number is 100,000 less this year, and I hope when I'm here next year, it'll be even lower. Uh, that, that's definitely an area of focus for us uh, to get more money out of things like that and into supporting children. Um, 
So the next uh, category is uh, services. And so uh, anytime, I know for our board in particular, uh, I get lots of questions from the school board about contracted services and making sure uh, that we're not spending money on folks to do things that we should be able to do for ourselves. Uh, and um, as, you're, as you're aware from the, the most recent budget process, uh, our greatest uh, contracted service is our custodial contract. Uh, so that contract's a little over $3.2 million. Uh, other items in that, in that total include about $550,000 for SROs that we contract with from the municipalities, as well as uh, EMS services that, uh, that have a presence at our athletic events. Um, some of those contracted services are connected to our specialized programs. And so we have uh, dual immersion programs where students get to learn another language. There are some, con we work with a contractor to locate those <coughs> teachers for us, bring them in from other countries, and to handle their training. Uh, professional development is, is a big piece of our services. So our teachers are required, and our principals are required to get a certain amount of professional development, and they earn credits every year. Uh, and that, that's a perk of, of working with us, is that we help take care of those expenses uh, that come along with that. Uh, printing is, you know, is pretty substantial. So, you know, you've been a school teacher. She's a lot of paper, uh, and so we uh, we see a lot of printing costs. Um, utilities is another large is another large service on our behalf. It takes a lot to power those buildings, uh, but we're grateful that you know with your support in performance contracting, we'll see that utility number come down quite a bit uh, over the next few years. Uh, and we're also, I know Dr. Thorpe is not here this evening, but. Uh, we, we were able to successfully close on that performance contracting on the 14th and work will start on making those improvements in January. So we're, we're very excited to see all that uh, come to fruition. So this uh, next slide just further breaks down uh, the services that we're using the local dollars for. And as you can see, the bulk of that is coming from local for contracted services and that's with the custodial contract and SROs being the two big chunks there. Um, we do have some maintenance needs that we have to contract out, so occasionally we do have to call in uh, contractors to do some work on our facilities for us. Um, and so that's, those are really the main points uh, that I wanted to hit there with you all for local services. Uh, supplies, and so this is uh, an, another area of interest. Um, so the, you know, this, the top line with supplies and digital resources, that just includes things we're getting in the hands of students, books, paper, uh, software. And so we, we're now at a point where every teacher has a device in their hands. Um, and we're, the last I checked, within 500 or so students of every student having a device in their hands of some nature. Um, and so we're, our teachers are using more and more software to reach our students. Uh, so uh, at each school, uh, we, uh, we award $70 per student for instructional supplies and $25 per student for software in order for them to, to, to purchase what they need to reach those kids. Um, operational supplies would include things like heating <coughs> oil, um, fuel for the buses, uh, just you know, tires, things of that variety, um, equipment that they're using in our maintenance facilities. Uh, our event expenses are not too terribly high, and that, that's mainly ex expenses that um, are incurred with uh, field trips um, or any time that we need to rent a facility uh, that's not one of our own. Um, Non-capital equipment would be any kind of equipment we have purchased. Um, generally, generally, it's going to be a computer of some variety that lands in that category as far as our expenses are concerned. And so this just further breaks down how much of that is coming from local. And so I already had uh, gone into detail on what a lot of those things are, but that just shows you what we're, what we're able to do with your local dollars. May I ask you a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, we, at budget time, we get a lot of concern comments from the public about books sure. and textbooks, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the supplies and digital resources the textbook money um, so, so some schools uh, some schools do use those dollars to buy actual textbooks uh, and so we have uh, we have an allotment from the state that is specifically for tech we can choose to do textbooks or software and so it just depends on the need at that school so we're we are deferred to them to, to determine what their needs are going to be uh, but I have seen a blend of, of textbooks and software purchases coming through this year so the textbook buying decision, the or what the what is purchased for a particular school, is that 
the principal's decision? So we have um, we have a curriculum department that that works with them to to determine approved textbooks, and then um, you know they make decisions on you know how many can we get, how many could we afford with X, Y, or Z dollars, um, and I think one challenge. One challenge that we find with textbooks is, um, as a district, if we adopted just for one subject area the same book <coughs> across a certain a certain grade level, it would be about a million dollars. So textbooks are have gotten really cost inefficient, and some of that I blame on the industry. You know, if you've had a kid going through college, you you see how expensive the textbooks are, and and so that's <coughs> that's become a real challenge for all school systems. And I think that's got a lot to do with why we've seen so much movement to software. Uh, we, we've gone a lot further with that and one thing we really I, I have heard just kind of being in the trenches with folks purchasing these things is that they'll find they'll buy a piece of software and they can they can put a student on that machine um, and this is especially the case at Hallfields that's had a lot of success he'll get those kids on that on that software and it'll figure out exactly where they are and it can determine this student is this degree below grade level so we need to start them at X, Y, or Z lesson to get them on track. And that, that's a really powerful tool that some of our successful schools have been using with software, but um, we still do see some textbook purchases that come through. So if a person, if a parent's concerned about the textbooks in the school, who is the best person for them to reach out to with those concerns? Is it the teacher or the principal? Or I, I, would, say, I, would, I would say they start, and Dr. Benson, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe Dr. Boss's area. <laughs> In Kariki, so Dr. Bost, the Assistant Superintendent for Student Learning, would be a good place to start. Uh, so she'll be familiar with what all 36 schools have in place for their plans. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, so this was another um, topic of concern for every school district, uh, just the, the number of students that we have transitioning into charter schools. And so as you know, the, the school system kind of functions as the middleman. And so we, we get the dollars from the county, and then as our students um, opt to enroll in a charter school instead, we have to ensure that the local money follows them uh, to that school. So we, uh, general statute requires us to share uh, the county appropriation and any fines and forfeitures that we receive from the court system on a per pupil basis. Um, as you can see this year, we have a little over 1,500 students. Um, we do have three charter schools in the county, but not all 1,500 of them go to those three. We do have some who choose to go to a charter school in Guilford, Chatham, Orange, just sort of all over the place. Um, and that represents about 6% of the dollars that we're receiving uh, that ultimately funnel over to the charter schools. And uh, we, get, we receive a bill from them each month, and we verify that those students do indeed live in the boundaries of Alamance County. And when you quote an, a, <coughs> an attendance or capacity or whatever, that includes the charter schools, right? The so if we're, if, we're, if we're identifying for you how many kids we have in, in the, the system, system, we do not include them. Oh, you don't? We only include who we actually have enrolled. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, and so in this, in this charter school number is one that we have seen grow at about a rate of a 1% per year. Um, that, are, that are choosing to go to those schools. Uh, but anytime that we pull numbers to, to, uh, to identify what is our total enrollment, we share uh, the number that are, that are physically enrolled. And uh, when the Department of Public Instruction allots money to us, uh, they look to see how many kids did they have in charter school last year. We're going to reduce them by that much on state. Uh, and then every year, and it's usually by the end of November, they will true that up and look to see how many was their was their guesstimate correct and so they'll they'll determine if they need to make an additional reduction in our state dollars or not um, and I think this year uh, when that adjustment occurred you know we had to forfeit a teaching position from our state dollars after they adjusted for our growth in charter schools so and so anytime you look at numbers from us or from them they're capturing how many kids we have in charter schools but that's on state money right right Okay, what about local money? And local money, anything, if, I, you know, if we came to you with a presentation about our per people funding, uh, we're, we're reflecting the number of kids we have in our seats. Yes, sir. But when you give them the local money, the charters is coming out of really the barrel for the other kids in a way. In a way, correct? yeah. In a way, yeah. yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. So we're the middleman, and I know that the, the charter <clears throat> school lobby, for lack of a better word, is. is um, has been asking to cut the middleman out and have the ability to come directly to, to funding bodies. And I think they're also looking for a share of capital outlay because right now 
they're on their own for facilities and uh, they've got the authority to borrow money to build and so there's some conversation going on around cutting us out of the middle and I, don't, I don't know if it'll get any traction in the long session uh, but that's certainly something on their radar to come to you directly now is there any consideration given on private and online as far as money is given so as far as if we have let's say for example um, if, if let's say if a new if a new <coughs> private school opened in Alamance County and 400 of our kids chose to go to that private school instead of enrolling in Alamance Burlington the state would capture that in our decreased enrollment and so we would see a drop in our state dollars because of that and uh, we are seeing uh, some of our charter schools um, are considered virtual charters so we do have some students who are choosing to enroll in online schools um, one, one's I think their name's virtual Academy um, the one thing I do like about them is general statute allows us to pass a lesser rate onto them so they they get earmarked in general statute and we have to pay them less money than we would a normal charter school so um, if they're going to go send them to a virtual yeah. so we, we get to keep more money <laughs> um, okay. um, the next uh, topic is capital revenue so these uh, these revenue sources are in addition to the million dollars that we get from the county uh, so typically you don't see the insurance proceeds category that uh, that eight hundred and ninety thousand dollars is connected to our claims for the roofing at Broadview Middle and Cummings High Schools and so I believe those roofing projects are actually very close to completion uh, so weather has not been our friend this year for a lot of reasons uh, and the, the figure for a lottery that reflects uh, some carryover uh, from the prior year as well as additional dollars um, that we're receiving this year. Um, the bond interest category is always a funny topic and I, I made a joke with Ms. Evans about that the other day that the bond that that, the, that bond passed when I was a junior at Cummings and so I kind of chuckled I said well, what is this bond interest deal and and so she explained that when we pulled when we sold those bonds we held that money in an interest bearing account and so this 256 627 is all we have left uh, from the earnings on that and we have made some fairly substantial purchases out of those dollars this year so if, if those are not exhausted by the end of this year definitely by next year that will totally be behind us which is very timely uh, with the new bonds coming on board um, I have a question yes ma'am does um do y'all get money from the sales tax a part a percentage of the sales tax so there there are two angles on that so I know that um, at the county level um, a percentage of the local sales tax uh, goes into a school capital reserve fund that sits on the county's books um, and then that that money is earmarked for school construction or capital outlay and then that works somehow into your budget process on how you feed those dollars into the capital funding stream and then as far as uh, sales tax in general uh, we, we pay we're responsible for paying the state portion of sales tax on anything we purchase um, it, it's been a number of years ago um, that we lost our exemption from sales tax altogether as school boards but the local share so that that two cents that's local we ultimately have refunded to us um, and I believe on the the local funding slide um, there is a hundred and thirty thousand dollars we're estimating we'll get back this year in local sales tax that we paid and um, we're hopeful that the state will consider this year giving us the state exemption back and that'll give us some of our purchasing power back as a district um, so those are kind of the two angles that I think about with sales tax in schools that's a good answer thank you <laughs> uh, yeah, really. um, and I appreciate it because uh, I saw the capital revenue and I thought well, where's the sales tax in here <laughs> and then that makes perfect sense that the county's holding that so you wouldn't put it in your slide yeah <laughs> so thank it. you yes, ma'am. Um, so the bond interest so this this was the category I, I kind of quipped at earlier uh, we've got this broken down and so these are numbers that uh, when the 1819 budget was developed we worked with dr. Thorpe's office to, to <coughs> determine what things are we going to do with that money um, the the largest expense there are the the mobile units um, and those so we have about 49 mobile units that are scattered throughout the county at different schools some of you know they're they're not they're not new really and so uh, we had and you'll see some pictures in a moment of the ones that we that we have already replaced uh, with with uh, newer uh, mobile units and um, we've got a couple of other large projects that are happening there and so that's why I feel confident that those bond interest dollars uh, will be gone fairly soon 
because um, I've seen those purchases starting to shift on through. Uh, this next slide uh, touches on the million dollars uh, that we received uh, from the county uh, this year, and it just sort of details the categories in which we're, we're spending those dollars. Uh, so it, and it, it's definitely going to brick and mortar uh, needs, uh, and so we, uh, we can see the impact of that. And we'll conclude the presentation with some pictures that show examples of what we've done with those dollars so you can see, see what you are getting for your money there. Um, the next slide is just a history of our lottery funding uh, from the 2009-2010 year and up. And so we're, we're seeing the one and a half million to one and to 1.7 million range being sort of the new normal. Um, and so coming here was from Caswell to Elements was an interesting transition for me in that Caswell has been banking their lottery money to go towards a new high school, which they're getting a new one. And, and here we need every penny of it to, to work on the various needs that we've got. And so we've been budgeting every penny of that money uh, to try to make things happen. And um, so we, we hope that that continues to be a, a flow of money for us uh, as we take on our projects. And this uh, next slide is just a summary of the projects we're anticipating to use lottery money on. I know at least for the next several years, we'll continue to have 450,000 shaved off the top to go towards the Career and Technical Education Center. Um, and we, we did quite a bit of painting this summer and we've got some pictures of that for you. Uh, the water tap category was, I know that we connected uh, Western Middle School to Ossipee's water. Uh, we had an exciting water leak with that not too long ago, but we've worked through that. Um, and so that, um, that's that been a nice improvement for us uh, to work with the town of Ossipee on that water supply for Western Middle that started this summer. Um, so let's get to the pictures. Uh, so this is just an example of some of the painting. Uh, Dr. Thorpe's office listed for me the schools uh, where we had painting projects. And so we've got some pictures of those, of those hallways with fresh paint, looks really good. Um, so these are some of the additional painting projects that happened. And, um, and we do, just with the volume of painting that we have, we do work with, um, with outside companies to help us get that amount of painting done in the summer months because we've got to get it done when the kids are not in school. So we did uh, remove some carpet, which I can't stand carpet, so I was excited to see that uh, they are getting rid of the carpet. And we've got kids with, almost everybody's got some form of allergy now or some sinuses. and so. Um, it's nice that we're, we're moving to this, uh, this type of flooring in our facilities. Uh, so we've, uh, we've made that investment at a number of uh, facilities this summer. Do you happen to know where the carpet was at AO that was removed? Was I do not. Way? I do not, but I can find out for you. Thank you. We'll get some follow-up for you on that. Uh, so we did um, go through some classroom uh, renovations. And uh, Dr. Thorpe's office was able to pull sort of a list of the areas where we had work done to specific classrooms. I know a lot of that involves bringing our, our spaces just kind of up to the needs of, of the learning that's going on. Uh, with, the, with the exception of Highland, uh, those are some really old buildings. And so uh, we're just trying to get those classrooms in line with the type of learning that's going on in those spaces. Uh, I alluded to the roofing earlier. Uh, the Broadview and Cummings have been sort of the most contentious roofing projects, but those, those are coming to an end. Uh, we did have to replace a section of roofing at Southern uh, this shortly before the start of school this summer. Uh, but so I think it's just a kind of a, it's like a game of whack-a-mole with roofing right now in uh, inclement weather. Um, so we did uh, also uh, replace some fire panels at some of our schools just to try to bring those up to standard um, and provide uh, the best systems we can have in place for those schools. Uh, we did have some, some flooding at the field house at Cummings and we had to make some improvements to that space. And so as, as an alum, I was excited to see they were able to make those improvements. Um, here we've got some pictures of the new mobile units that were installed at Hillcrest and South Nevin. And I know you're thinking, hey, we just passed a bond and we're going to add 16 classrooms to South Nevin. Well, and part of that will eliminate the need for those mobile units at South Nevin. Uh, and then ultimately we will, we will cycle those through and replace some of the other old mobile units we have elsewhere with the ones that we have purchased uh, for South Nevin. Alexander Wilson, we were able to, to put in some walkways uh, to improve access and, uh, and put a canopy in place for weather purposes. 
and then we were able to uh, to purchase some uh, some additional furniture, some new furnitures uh, for some of our our schoolhouses. Uh, so we've got old buildings with old furniture in it, and uh, we 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 use furniture until it's absolutely worn down. Uh, so uh, some of these some of these cases uh, we needed to make some improvements to the furniture in the libraries, cafeterias, in the in the learning spaces. Uh, and then Dr. Thorpe's staff just put some additional projects on there for me uh, of some other things that we have done uh, with the capital dollars this summer. Uh, so that is my last slide, and I know it's a tremendous amount of information. We've got a lot going on. So I didn't know if there were any additional questions for me uh, or Dr. Benson before I took a seat. I got a question on security in the schools uh -huh. with all the incidents that are happening across the country um, uh, what are we doing as far as focusing on that yes so we we've got a couple of things that have been rolled out uh, I know that we've we recently used uh, one of our federal grants uh, allowed for the purchase of safety equipment and in making some improvements in those spaces and so now um, at each school um, we're rolling this out in January now that we've gotten everything uh, there will be an identical kiosk at every school that requires visitors to check in uh, they have to scan their driver's license and it checks databases uh, to make sure that they're not a sexual offender or anything of that nature. Um, and, it, and it's one of those barriers that it's not going to stop someone, but it, it can slow folks down. Right. Um, we are also in the works of, of putting in vestibules or some enclosures in spaces. You know, we've got a number of schools where someone can uh, get buzzed <laughs> into the building, but then once you're in, you're in. And so uh, we're work Dr. Thorpe's area is working on a plan to put in place some additional layers so that once you're in, you're in a more confined space and someone needs to lay a little more, little more look on you to make sure that you're legitimate uh, before you can get too deep I into the building. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. A great idea. That thing with Smith High School and yeah. the guy walking in and everything just brought my brought that to my mind. So, uh, so, any, so we're, we're just looking at anything we can do to at least slow folks down to give mm -hmm. first responders an opportunity uh, to be there. Uh, we received uh, some additional uh, funding. The state offered some grant opportunities this year uh, and so we received additional dollars for SRO support and we're and that's for the elementary level so we're seeing an SRO presence even more so in our elementary schools. Uh, and then we're also replacing some some outdated intercom equipment. Uh, we're finding at some of our schools that just with the, they've got so many buildings that are scattered everywhere. Sometimes it's hard to communicate uh, with the entire campus with existing intercoms. So we're replacing some intercom systems as well uh, nice. to improve communication. I think Dr. Benson has oh, some. Um, just yes, he's, he can't wait to just, talk just, about. Just to add from the procedural <laughs> side of things is that we are working closely with local law enforcement. Actually, we have a meeting tomorrow morning with the sheriff's office to, to talk about um, uh, training for our, for our schools. We we did our first active shooter training this year ever uh, in the summer prior to the start of the school. We want to do we want to do more of that. We've had an opportunity to meet with agents from the State Bureau of Investigation and their interest and willingness to help us look at our physical facilities and determine whether or not there are improvements that they might be able to identify, as well as help us look at our threat assessment model. Um, so we've got a lot of moving parts here that I think that will um, improve safety and security throughout the, throughout the school system. Uh, and actually tomorrow, um, late afternoon, uh, we're going to have our couple of agents from the S SBI and uh, a trainer from uh, DPI come in and work with our principals and school resource officers and help folks understand how that partnership is supposed to work. So we, we've got a fair number of things in that area moving forward. Thank you. Let me ask a question about mobiles. You said we had how many mobiles? Fifty. It's about forty-nine. Forty-nine, fifty. Okay. You know, years ago, <coughs> state average was uh, of students in mobiles across the state was ten percent. Oh wow! And I think that would be under five percent uh, technically for us, wouldn't it? Yeah. And I think another concern that we have with that is. Um, so each year for the next three or four years, we're going to see a, a, um, a decrease in the number of kids we're allowed to have in a kindergarten through third grade. Right. And I know there's been a lot of chatter about that and the strain that's going to put on facilities. Uh, so that, that's going to be increasingly an answer for us at the elementary level if we keep on the track of dropping class sizes. Uh, but so right now, I mean, it's, I don't think we want any. In a perfect world, we wouldn't have any. And so I'm, I'm glad that it's the percentage that it is. Um, and but we're we are nervous that we could have more as the average class size keeps having to drop uh, based on state guidelines for K through three. 
I'm glad you've held it at the level that it's at, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> Back in the spring when I was touring schools with Dr. Thorpe, in particular at the high schools, the way they're the buildings are spread out and sec separated. Discuss the issue of security there uh, tr and trying to do a lockdown of the whole facility versus being able to even lock down one building at a time. Are we addressing that at all right now? That, that's a tough question. And I'll, I'll, look at the, I'll look at the boss on that one. <laughs> yeah. So that is a particular challenge. And all of our schools develop uh, safety plans that are unique to their facilities. And so the strategies that we use at an open campus are going to look a little bit different from a campus that we'll be able to secure because all of the rooms are you know, inside of a single, a single building. Part of what we'll be looking at moving forward and getting some input from the uh, State Bureau of Investigation is what else can we do you know, short of enclosing those schools, which is something that I think was looked at some number of years ago and, and that was just cost, cost prohibitive. But I'm, I'm confident there are additional measures that we can take in our open campus schools to improve security there um, as well. And, and one of those things has to do with uh, the security of those doors and our ability to right. lock them electronically, which right now we don't, well, we don't have that ability. Right. Okay. Is there anything else? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. We're going to have a five-minute recess because I think a lot of people are going to change out of their seats. So let's have a five-minute recess. Jump out of your seats. I see a lot of school boards people are going to have to Time frame of this year, uh, the county received six proposals for these services, and the proposals were reviewed by uh, the Sheriff's Department staff. And after reviewing the proposals and uh, going through all the information in each packet, uh, the Sheriff's Office is recommending that uh, the provider Paytel uh, receive this uh, award. Uh, the proposed contract with Paytel will be for three years, and the contract also uh, includes the ability to extend the agreement uh, twice for one year periods each. There is no cost to Alamance County for these services. The county doesn't pay for these services. Uh, the inmates pay for the service. The county does receive a commission for the services uh, when they're provided to the inmates. So, and in your packet uh, that you received, you had a copy of the RFP that was put out by purchasing in the Sheriff's Department. Score sheet uh, that uh, staff uh, put together after reviewing all the proposals and the proposed agreement. So at this time, if the commissioners have any questions, I would certainly uh, defer to the Sheriff's Office for any technical questions about, uh, about the uh, agreement. I will say that uh, this process has been run according to county policy and state law, uh, and it's been found acceptable. So uh, we are prepared to support uh, the recommendation of uh, offering the work to pay town. So mm -hmm. if you have any questions, be happy to answer. Yeah, to share, tell me how that works. How does, how does your people that's in prison pay for the service that you provide? They, well, the service is, is the phone system. They have to pay to make phone calls okay. uh, to their family on their video, visitation, et cetera. And all systems in the state is, is gone to that, uh, you know, around the country. Uh, Paytail has uh, the business in 54 counties in the state of North Carolina and the surrounding counties. And we, we checked uh, and talked to some people. The closest uh, I see solutions was, I think, in Farmville, Virginia that we found. Now, and I'm sure they're a good company. But uh, Paytel is housed right out of Greensboro, North Carolina. And I can tell you, I'm getting tired of calling people for stuff at the jail that's in another state. Yeah, we'll be there next week. And then you see them a month later. Yeah. We would love to within the state of North Carolina because I can drive to Greensboro if I have to. I think that's important. <laughs> Shop local. That's a good yes, sir. theory. Yes, sir. It, well, it's, it is interesting that they both come out equally. What <coughs> does Paytel have to offer that would oh, my, my fact that they're local? What, I, I, what, I, what I found, is, uh, you know, service. Quick to come, maintenance. You can call immediately. Uh, you know, and, and they work. If you looked at what they could do, it's pretty equal. But Paytel, uh, their reputation with the agencies we contacted, which some of those sheriffs I know real well, uh, sold me on Paytel. So, and it's, through the it, process, it, right? and let me say this, uh, nothing against uh, the other companies, but Paytel is a 
company in North Carolina and the money would be staying in North Carolina. How does an inmate pay for the phone service? Their, their people can put money in in, the, uh, in an account. Right, in an account, same thing. It's like and a debit card they can. Or? Right. Mm -hmm. I'll make the motion we support it. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the <coughs> visitations, the phone and video visitation services contract as outlined by the county manager. Is there any more discussion? Can you give an estimate of, let's say, I get in jail, Bill, you come visit me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be glad to visit you. Send somebody. <laughs> How much does it cost? I mean, uh, for instance, are you talking about it depends on the amount of time you talk. When you're on the other side of the glass and you're at a table and you're mm -hmm. talking, so you get billed for that? No. You don't get billed for that. Oh, okay. It's, That's uh, what I was it, Video. Videos. Yeah. Videos. Yeah. 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 Online video online. Right. situation. Oh, okay. Yeah. It will cost you nothing, Bill. Come on, I'll see you. I'll come see you, Tim. Nobody else will, so I'll hold I'll you to it. Yeah, we'll I'll hold that. you to it. All right. All right. We have a motion and a second. Uh, is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Osborne. Yes. Family Justice Center has a renewal of a grant period. Yes, I have several things, so we'll start with that. Um, so this finance needs the commissioners to approve acceptance of this grant. It's the Governor's Crime Commission grant. Um, does not require a county match. $756,177. Um, family Justice Centers are a priority for the Governor's Crime Commission. This money is used locally in our Family Justice Center and we contract with Family Abuse Services for positions with them as well. You have a fact sheet explaining the grant, um, the um, proposals, the goals, the contracted personnel, and the, of course, the outcomes that are projected and at this no grant. County match. Two years. The county match is in kind. Okay. You know, you provide the building, um, those things. I'll make a motion with you. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve. Uh, is there any more discussion? If not, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Okay, now we have a Here grant application for the family for the FJC. So we have an elder justice grant. Um, we we're we will come to. The end of our second year in September, the end of our grant year in September of 19, 2019. Um, we have been encouraged to apply for continuation funding. This grant focuses on training mostly law enforcement and our district attorney's office on financial exploitation um, and how to recognize and be aware of elder abuse. We would like to apply for that grant through Office of Violence Against Women and Governor's Crime Commission because we feel like this is um, an expansion of family justice centers into the elder abuse arena. And um, we like to be kind of trailblazers with that. So we are asking for permission to apply for those two grants that will start when our current grant ends. I have a note that we need to have two separate votes, one for the grant for the Office for Violence, violence against, against Women. Against women. Mm -hmm. So, and then a second vote for the Governor's Crime Commission grant. So, we would be seeking first a motion. Anybody wants to make one to approve the mm -hmm. Office for Violence Against Women grant? So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for that. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, and then second, we are seeking a motion to approve the grant application for the Governor's Crime Commission on Elder Abuse. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for that one. Uh, is there any more discussion? If well, none of these will stop you know, robocalls trying to get my money, though, right? No, not <laughs> one. Yes, <sir. laughs> I'm afraid not. Is that elder abuse thing? Yeah, that's elder <laughs> abuse, definitely. That's right. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I would like to add that the um, Impact Alamance has um, a program to allow us to apply for grant writer services. So they have funded us writing these two grants and are providing some assistance to us. 
Thank you. Yes. And then you have a social service agreement provision. Yes, I do. Would you like to with our county manager. Lead off? Well, I, I can. So you got lots of documents in this packet. Um, I'll uh -huh. I practice summarizing this on um, Commissioner Sutton and, and Commissioner Boswell the other day. So um, what you have is a new MOU. If you remember, we spent some time um, in the spring discussing um, with Clyde Albright's help um, and crafting a signing statement that went along with our approval to the MOU required by the Department of Health and Human Services, which is performance indicators on your County Department of Social Services. 26 indicators. Um, and the consequences of not meeting those indicators, if you remember, was um, corrective action plans and um, ultimately the possibility of withholding of fund, federal funds. Um, I'm happy to report that um, we have been in constant communication, the County Commissioners Association um, and the Association of County Directors of Social Services with our state around these um, MOUs and what you have is a revised MOU, an amendment. Um, that amendment says pretty much two things. Um, that you, these measures, some of them, if you remember when we talked about them, were dependent upon court time, they were dependent upon other systems that the county really didn't have much of an impact. Right. And if we failed them, then we would be penalized. Um, so the newest amendment that you have before you um, moves many, many of those measures to growth measures and a realization that the county needs to provide leadership in moving a community towards that and growth measures in terms of measuring where the county is now and what is reasonable growth and instead of expecting everybody to be at 95 percent if you're at 60 percent you might need to move from 60 to 65 next year so um, we have those 17 of the 26 have moved to growth measures um, there will be no corrective action this year through um, June 30th in this new amendment. Um, we're in the process of validating data right now. Um, and so I recommend, and you'll have to hear from your county manager, but I recommend <laughs> signing this amendment because if we don't, we'll stay under the old one, which is much more stringent. Well, Susan speaks very well to this. She is the uh, head of her uh, association and uh, has worked very hard to make sure the county's perspective has been included uh, at the state level. And that's very important to us because the original agreement gave us all some concerns. In fact, uh, yeah. Mr. Albright drafted a statement to put along with ours to send down saying, we're signing this because the law says we have to, but we have some real concerns about it. So uh, after talking with Susan and with, uh, with Clyde and looking over the, the revised terms, I think it is a better uh, agreement for the county. Uh, they are uh, making it very clear there's not going to be any corrective action against the county this fiscal year. I think, they, I think the state has listened to feedback they received from the counties uh, and uh, is working to try to make this a better agreement. So I would certainly recommend to the board that we do sign it. We do have to sign it by law, uh, but uh, I think it is a much better agreement. Thank you to Susan uh, and her association for the hard work they've done to try to get it rectified. So it does take uh, uh, board approval, and then Susan and I will both sign it as we did the original. I will move that we do that. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agreement that the law requires us to approve. So, <laughs> <laughs> if there's not going to be any discussion. So, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. It's hard Great. to vote against something you're required to vote. <laughs> yes, right. it is. Thank you very much. We can try it a little bit. We always went to jail a couple of years ago over there. So I think that was the one time a day of the past. Remember that? What they threatened to put us in jail if we didn't, <laughs> didn't sign something. Yeah, yeah, I remember something. Like that. I don't remember what it was. I can't remember what it was. Uh, that's why I asked, would you visit? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, Mr. Hager, you got um, something about the Mental Health Diversion and Restoration Center Director position request. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, I'm here uh, this evening to ask that you consider and approve the creation of a new county uh, employee position. Uh, I don't usually do this in the middle of a fiscal year, but these funds that I'm proposing to use are mental health maintenance of effort funding that we must use uh, by law to uh, provide mental health services, and I hope that you'll agree that this is a reasonable way to do so. Uh, the county is required to budget $1,203,000 
$556 uh, every year in MOE money, maintenance of effort money. Uh, these are mental health funds that we have to spend annually. This comes back uh, from back when the state divested the counties of the legal requirement to provide mental health services. But the dollar amount that the county was spending at that time was frozen, and it was uh, uh, $1.2 million. So uh, we're still required by law to budget this money. It's, it is county tax dollars, but it's money that we're required to spend on these type services. Um, back in 2017, until 2017, we had been uh, allocating these funds to Cardinal Innovations, which is the uh, state uh, group that provides mental health services for Alamance County and we have been giving those funds to Cardinal and they would divvy out uh, what, what to do with it on our behalf. In 2017 uh, we, we took those funds back. Cardinal recommended that we do that. We work with them uh, and we now contract directly with uh, the mental health uh, maintenance of effort money with four different groups. RHA Health Services, RHA provides a crisis service uh, for uh, residents of Alamance County. If you're experiencing crisis, you can go there and see folks that will, uh, will help you. We also contract with ARMC for the provision of nurses and staff uh, in the ER that help people that are having uh, mental health issues. Uh, Ralph Scott Life Services, we contract with those folks to provide transportation for folks with uh, developmental disabilities and mental health issues, as well as residential treatment services of Alamance County. Uh, we uh, contract with them to spend uh, MOE money with those folks also to help provide medicine for the people that <coughs> residential treatment services treats. Um, so I, we, we contract out this $1.2 million to all those different groups. We've been doing it now for the past two years, and each year we have a balance left of $54,305. So what I'm proposing to do is uh, that we use this $54,305 of uh, maintenance of effort funds, this, these mental health funds, to create a new county position. This position would be allocated to the Alamance County Health Department. Uh, the Health Department, there would be costs above this $54,305. Those costs would be the uh, benefits, and if the, uh, it would be a county employee, so it could be subject to any kind of merit raise or any of those other type programs that any other county employee would be subject to. Those would be the responsibility of the Health Department to find those funds. Uh, the 54305 would always come from the middle, uh, middle health money. Uh, this person would be called the Restoration Center Director, and uh, we have several uh, functions that we believe this uh, position could serve. Uh, the position would oversee the development of the new mental health diversion and restoration center that we've received uh, $1.2 million from Cardinal Innovations, and then Mr. Petrie has also graciously uh, donated up to half a million dollars to help uh, take the old elderly services building and turn it into the mental health diversion center. So this person would be responsible for coordinating that project. We have an RFP out right now to find uh, uh, architect or designer to go in and give us specs that we can build out, uh, bid out to fix that building up. So this person would be responsible for handling that part of the project as well as once the diversion center is open. This would be very similar to the Family Justice Center where we have a county employee that works in the Family Justice Center coordinates the day-to-day -day activities there and all the nonprofits there like the liaison between county government and the folks that are in the Family Justice Center. This person would be the same thing for the uh, mental health groups that would be in the um, diversion center. They would also manage these uh, mental health contracts. So we now contract directly with all these different companies, these four different providers, but we need someone that is watching those contracts, making sure that each one of those providers are doing what the contract says. and. Uh, just recently, within the past year or so, the commissioners have created the Justice Advisory Council, and the Justice Advisory Council really is going to be in a position to make recommendations about how to better spend these funds and what kind of terms to put in the contracts so we can expect uh, better mental health services out of our providers. This uh, employee would be responsible for making sure that what the JAC wants to uh, enact would come before the commissioners and then go into the contracts, and there would be some accountability there. And uh, the final task, main task for the new uh, position, would be to coordinate the county's opioid crisis response. You know, we, we've had a lot of work, a tremendous amount of work from our health department, and social services, and many other county departments, including EMS and several other ones, working to try to help our county combat uh, the opioid crisis. And there's been a lot of strategies designed and put forward, and someone needs to follow through with those strategies, and this would be the person. So. In your packet, uh, you have a job description for the Restoration Center Director. You also have a letter of support from the Board of Health. Uh, we have Stacy Saunders here with us this evening, uh, who uh, would, of course, be the ultimate uh, supervisor of this position. 
at this time, I would be happy to answer uh, any questions about it. And uh, therefore. Any questions? Uh, I mean, it sounds like you work through what you need there in the description of the job and so forth. Well, and I think the, the, the key for me from a budgetary perspective is the lion's share, the vast amount of these funds are mental health funds that we must spend uh, somehow on mental health services. spent no matter what, right? Yes. So. I see this as a benefit of taking, this is one benefit for us taking back the direct contracting and uh, we're able to, to make these kind of decisions. It gives us control more so of the funds as they filter through. That's correct. The mental health has to come up with the any increases in salary yes and it, and the benefits expense that's correct so uh we would be seeking a motion to uh, approve the position request so move second that all right we have a motion and a second is there any more discussion if not all in favor please say aye aye, aye. anyone opposed Got a fiscal policy revision. Uh, Commissioner, so we're, we are working to prepare ourselves for the upcoming bonds. Uh, and part of that process, uh, as we identified back in March, as we were working through our capital plan, uh, was to make some revisions to our uh, fiscal policies. So uh, what I'm requesting for you uh, to consider this evening is that uh, you approve the new fiscal policy that's included in your packet. I've put in your packet the, the new policy as well as the existing one. And you'll notice there are call outs uh, in the new policy that give you some idea of what we're changing. We also, uh, uh, the minute track cover sheet will give you a pretty good idea of, of the main points, <coughs> excuse me, that we're, we're wanting to change. This new version of the fiscal policy has been drafted with the help of our county finance department, of course, our legal department, and with Davenport, the folks that have been helping us navigate our way through planning for these $189 million worth of bonds. And uh, the hope is the new version of these fiscal policies uh, will help us uh, help us do a lot of things. But one of the main things I hope that it will help us do is when we go to issue debt, uh, we'll be reviewed by the credit rating agencies. And uh, we hope that having some of these things in place will put us in a position to possibly get uh, a credit upgrade, which would save us uh, on interest, of course. Um, so. Just a few examples of the changes. I'm not going to read the entire policy to you, but I wanted to make sure you, you had a good idea of what these new, the changes include. Now, we've put some new guidelines regarding capital planning, uh, regular reporting to the board, and deferred maintenance in the fiscal policies. We've also included, if you remember back in March, uh, we had a few uh, debt ratio indicators that uh, Davenport recommended that we put in our policies or make some changes to ones that uh, were already in our policies. The first one uh, is that tax supported debt shall be limited to 3% of assessed value of taxable property. Currently our policy uh, limits it to 8%. So what that does is it lowers the total debt amount that we would have in our policy from uh, over $1 billion, that's the dollar amount we could be uh, in debt, we could have in debt, uh, to $420 million. That would be by our policy, our max, and we feel like that's a, a reasonable amount. Um, second debt, debt ratio indicator is that debt service shall be limited to 15% rather than 10% of general fund expenditures. This is uh, an increase because we know if uh, we do these bonds, we're going to be paying out uh, more, it's going to be a, a higher payment. So uh, we, would, we would recommend raising uh, the, that ratio from 10% to 15%. And the final debt ratio indicator is a 10-year principal payout ratio set at 50%. This is per the capital plan. This has a bearing on our structured debt. You know, we've talked a lot about should we do structured debt? Right. Could we do structured debt? Uh, if we were going to uh, try to do structured debt, the, uh, the state, of course, has some policies in place, the four to one ratio that we would have to abide by, but this policy would also keep us in line to make sure that we're not putting ourselves in a bad financial uh, place. We would also recommend in these policies changing the unassigned fund balance percentage. Currently, unassigned fund balance percentage, our target is 25%. We are not there and are not probably going to get to 25% anytime soon. So we, we, instead of setting ourselves up for uh, failure, we would recommend that we re, uh, reduce that to 20%. That would make uh, $30.4 million our target to have in fund balance, which I believe right now we have 18.3 uh, uh, per our last audit. So, um, And uh, the 
policy also requires that we do quarterly finance reports and have a biannual <coughs> investment report to the board. Uh, our auditors have made it uh, plain to us it's important. You're approving budget amendments. You need to have in front of you regularly financial reports from the uh, from the county, so uh, mm -hmm. you can you can be in the know. Um, we do have uh, all the existing policy guidelines for the very most part have been re included in the revised policy. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions. Guideline 1.6. This is one I, I call out because uh, uh, it's important for you to think about. Um, it, it conflicts with our plan to issue bond debt per our capital finance plan. So guideline 1.6 in the original policy says the tax rate shall be set each year based on the cost of providing general government services. Rates shall be adjusted periodically but shall not result in revenues exceeding a 5% annual growth rate and ad valorem tax revenues excluding growth in valuation or an increased collection rate. So if we kept the policy as it is today, uh, the maximum property tax rate increase that we would be able to do by our policy is 2.95 cents. We know, as I've put to you, that that would not cover the, uh, uh, the cost of the bonds. So I would recommend that we, uh, we take that piece out. It is still within the purview of the County Board of Commissioners to set the property tax rate. You will still get a recommended budget from me that includes capital and operating. So uh, it just seems uh, like it would behoove us not to have a policy that uh, goes against what we see uh, coming. What was, when was that policy instituted? You're saying we couldn't raise taxes past 2.9, right? Okay, when was that instituted? So that, uh, this policy was last approved in 2016, mm -hmm. but I think that was primarily for the uh, fund balance percentage uh, change at that time. So Technically I'm not sure when this was approved in its original uh, format. So I don't know. So it, it's been historically, I think one of the last times that was brought before the board was back in 2004. Wow. Oh, so I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. If that was there, how'd you get five cents? I'm <laughs> building on <I'm gone. laughs> <laughs> yeah, thought I was going to overlook it. Yeah. Really? Five cents? Uh, there were also That's several got questions. Got you you got to answer all that? I mean, no, I, I don't. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, you know, the board. The board can do what they please. Right. That's true. That's what I think he's saying. <laughs> yes. No matter what the policies are. It is. And I think we're we're trying to put our best foot forward with the credit rating agency. So we want them to be as accurate as possible. Uh, yeah. But but these policies do have uh, some statements in them that say the board can opt to not go by the policy. So if there is a time that we found ourselves in a need to do something financially that didn't go by the policy, that's still possible. But it would mean I'm supposed to come to you and explain this is where we are, this is what we need to do. I think it's more of a communication tool to make sure you understand as a board what we're uh, proposing to do as staff. And I think it's also a good communication to the rate, uh, rating agencies to let them know we're on top of our finances, we're in clear communication with you, right. and uh, all's well in the world in Alamance County financially. So. Um, we do have several other pieces of the existing policy uh, that are not included, and it, it just seemed like they were uh, normal operations as opposed to a need for an actual policy listing. Uh, these include uh, 1.4, assessed valuation shall be estimated based on historical trends and growth patterns, which we do uh, on a regular basis every year. 2.3 recommended that performance measures, performance measures will be implemented, which they have been. 6.4, financial condition will maintain minimum bond ratings, which we certainly strive to do. 7.3, uh, collections will be closely monitored, which uh, Jeremy's folks do a great job uh, keeping up with collections. And we have a system of inventory control as 7.8 uh, required uh, that we established. So um, we also removed guideline 2.5 uh, regarding the distinguished <clears throat> budget award. Uh, we will work towards that goal. That is not one that we have uh, uh, received yet, but we will continue to work toward it. But I think uh, it's going to take some more uh, uh, work in the finance department to get us to that place. We have CAFRs and PAFRs. <coughs> we're doing both of those awards now, and we'll work on the budget award. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. I and mean, we have a great team of folks here that have worked very hard on this. So uh, uh, I feel confident if you have questions, uh, we, we should be able to answer them. Well, I've got a question about, I thought I heard back when we met with Davenport that the more money, you, if, you, if you owed money, they liked that in the bond rating because they thought, well, you're willing to raise taxes to pay for it. You're progressive, blah, blah, blah. Now it seems like there's a reversal here. Uh, am I, is, is there somewhat of a 
Well, I think what I think what the rating agencies would uh, like to see is that we're acknowledging that we're watching our finances, we're watching our borrowing percentages, and we're communicating that to the commissioner. So, uh, I think that's really the key part of these policies. Now, they'll analyze our debt loads, and uh, all that will be examined when we go to issue the debt. I don't know if. Uh, uh, Ted, if you had yeah, anything to add. I might just add, I don't think it's necessarily, I'm Ted Cole with Davenport, yes. um, how much debt you have outstanding, but certainly for any amount of debt you have outstanding, they want to see that it can be repaid in a sustainable fashion from current year revenues as opposed to one-time revenues. But, um, and they certainly, the rating agencies, um, um, are supportive of elected officials that are willing to, you know, balance the budget in a sustainable way um, in order to, you know, take on additional debt and projects. But I don't, th I don't think necessarily any amount of debt, more or less, is looked at favorably or not, as long as you know needs are being met. And you know, there's a discussion about the CIP. Part of the policy is developing an annual CIP and then funding that CIP based on your annual budget process. Um, I, I'll just, one last thing I'll say, and I think the county manager did an excellent job of explaining all of this. Um, from a rating agency perspective, and I realize they're not the only audience out there, but, but they really do find comfort in the fact that if there are policies that they are board adopted, um, they certainly understand that when you have certain policies that have percentages assigned to them that there may be a reason, uh, a very good reason, to go um, through that percentage, high or low, whatever it is. Um, and rather than just adjusting the policy to accommodate whatever it is that you want or need to do, um, it's my opinion, and we've seen this in a number of occasions, that the board being able to make an exception to a policy, um, particularly by virtue of a planning process that's underway and your staff brings to you, if we do this, we will need to make an exception to the policy. Um, what, what the rating agencies get comfort is that there's that conversation going on and that you all are making decisions um, knowing all the facts and, um, you know, and, and that an exception is being made, but you do so knowingly and ideally you make a commitment to get back into compliance within some reasonable period of time. So it's really about the process and the dialogue, less so about the specific percentage um, or whether you're, you know, you're, you've got lots of capacity or a little bit of capacity. So I think the process in and of itself is really where the value is. Let me ask you a question. We talked about this when we did meet. If you look at the ratings, of the mega counties that are in debt up to their earlobes, in my opinion, some of them, they got AAA ratings. And you come down to the level where, you know, we're sitting here looking at next to the, if not, for all intents and purposes, lowest bonded debt is per capita of any county out of 20 some counties that we're in a group of. Yet we only get the AA minus or whatever. No AAAs in that group, I don't believe. Might be, but I don't, I don't remember seeing any. But uh, well, we'll see. I mean, do they think so it's going to pay their bills better than we Well, it, the, the, the rating agencies have moved to a, a much more transparent and consistent methodology of rating local governments. Debt accounts for 10 to 20 percent of the rating. So it's not a key drive. It's an important factor. Economy is 30 percent. And when you're talking about economy, you're talking about the tax base, okay. the tax base per capita. You're talking about wealth levels. Um, that's 30 percent of the rating. Finances are about 30 percent of the rating. Management is 20 percent and debt's 20 percent generally. So um, Many times, those local governments that are AAA rated, which is the highest rating you can achieve, um, are generally high growth. Um, the economy is growing. Again, that's about 30% of the rating. Um, and with high growth comes a lot of capital needs. So they tend to also be those counties that have the highest amounts of debt. Um, but there are other dynamics going on that the rating agencies believe are offsetting to that fact. 
So where, where are we looking to get in our rating by? You're a double-A rated county, and, and um, within double-A, there are three levels within double-A, and then you get to triple-A. So I think um, our goal in this whole effort has been not only to, to get the funding when you all determine you need it, but also to do it in a way that even though we're taking on almost $200 million of projects over the next several years, that we can improve on the county's bond rating. Um, I don't believe that it's um, inconceivable that over time the county could achieve a AAA bond rating. may not happen in the next two to five years, but we'd like to see that you can move incrementally higher in the AA rating and then perhaps one day if a number of other things kind of fall into place that it would be a reasonable expectation to get to that AAA. Um, you know, some of the rating, one of the rating agencies is a little more stingy with that AAA than the other. So while they are very similar in their approach, they're not exactly the same and it's not uncommon for a county to have rating disparity from one or the other, <coughs> one's higher, one's lower. But you're very well positioned and we believe strongly that moving forward, we can put a plan in place and demonstrate the rating agencies there's an opportunity to improve the rating. Um, and I think these policies are just sort of one of those boxes to check. And, um, you know, we'll, they'll be watching sort of the budget process and, and the, the, the political will to, to do what you all need to do to be able to fund this new debt in a sustainable fashion. Who campaigns to get those ratings up? Did we do it? Does <laughs> they, they, yes, they want to hear from the county. Um, so it is some combination of elected officials and staff that the sheriff do it. will meet. <laughs> <laughs> that will meet with the rating analysts and tell the story. And they do a lot of their own research, obviously, but. Um, it's always nice for them. They can pull audits and budgets and look at all the data, but I think it's also important for them to hear from you all on the more subjective or qualitative factors that they need to consider. So how long did you say you thought it might take us to get to a AAA rating? <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> some, some few years, I don't know, a number of years. Can we, five, that, can we have that put in writing? <laughs> <laughs> I think it may be, but um, I'm just well, caveat that, you know, it, what's, it's, you know, I think it, I, I appreciate the question. It's, it's, it's not only about are you improving right. your rating measures or your, your ratios, but are you improving at a pace that is greater than the national or North Carolina medians are improving. So everybody might be, not everybody, but a majority might be improving certain wealth indicators. And if you're just moving with, with the group, uh, right. you're not really getting ahead. So it is a little bit difficult in terms of sort of mapping this out in time. Um, and you know, I, I would just say, I think it's a process every step towards AAA that you are working on gets harder and harder. Um, but I don't think it's inconceivable over some near medium term time frame to, to think that could be um, achievable. All right, well, let's get started with that tonight. If anybody wants to make a motion to approve the fiscal policy revisions as presented. Do we have a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Yep. Anyone aye. Opposed? Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of budget amendments, one from the library. All right, cool. Hello, Commissioners. Um, in case you don't know, I'm Susanna Goldman. I'm the Acting Interim Director for the Libraries after our Library Director retired. Um, so I have a budget amendment um, before you. We have, um, we were awarded uh, a state funding grant that was more than we were expecting to get. So there's an increase of $2,242 um, that we need to move and we would, or we need to add to our budget and we would like to add that towards um, the purchase of books this year. If you have any questions. motion that we approve that. I'll second. 
Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve that budget amendment. Is there any more discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. That's it. Okay, and uh, Mr. Hill. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, so I'm here to ask for your approval to transfer about 251000 from our retained earnings, our unrestricted <coughs> savings, if you will, um, to purchase a new Caterpillar excavator. Uh, we had originally proposed to replace this excavator in next year's budget, but it went south on us a few weeks ago. Uh, we've been through about four rebuilds, and you get the idea. So we've just determined it's going to be better to go buy a new one, take the existing unit, put it on gov deals. We have a, a much older 1990 model, uh, Hitachi, that's idle. We're also going to put that on gov deals. So we anticipate between the two pieces of equipment generating some fifty dollars to $100,000 in revenue. That kind of offsets the $250,000 we are asking. Uh, we don't have this year's audit yet, but we're looking at um, unrestricted funds north of $9 million coming up on the audit. So there's plenty of money to take care of it. I would make a motion that we approve that. Okay. Great, we have a motion and a second to approve that budget amendment for the landfill. <coughs> Is there any discussion or questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Haygood, do you have a report? Just a few quick things. First of all, I'd like to thank Susanna for stepping up and uh, being the interim at the library. I appreciate her uh, work very much. And uh, you also have in your packet uh, a copy of the fiscal update uh, for November 2018. You can look through it. This is part of our uh, keeping the board informed financially. And the last piece I just wanted to cover, as you um, have read and heard this evening, uh, last week the planning board uh, met and did discuss the uh, heavy industrial development ordinance. Uh, the, the planning board has made a recommendation that the commissioners <coughs> consider a moratorium on receiving uh, heavy industrial development ordinance applications for 59 days. Um, and the planning board does is uh, scheduled to meet again on January 10th. I'll be working with uh, Tanya Cattle, our planning director, to try to get some uh, possible changes and, and points of real interest that we've heard from uh, the folks from the snow camp area that are uh, unhappy about the quarry. Uh, try to get those things cataloged in a way that can be presented to the planning board to give some consideration to those points. Uh, and we'll be very specific about what those should be or could be. And we'll also be sure that the planning board has the opportunity to look at uh, some sample um, uh, ordinances similar to what we do here from other counties because we know that there are other folks that have these same issues and are trying to protect their, their people. So uh, the planning board has made this, <coughs> excuse me, recommendation of a moratorium. I think if we meet uh, on January 10th with the planning board and go over these possible changes at the January 22nd county commissioners meeting, we should be able to bring you back uh, some level of changed ordinance or uh, their recommendation uh, to do the moratorium. So I hope to be able to have an answer for you at the January 22nd uh, meeting. In the meantime, I do want to let the board know that we've taken several steps to try to prevent this particular uh, issue was that the board didn't know about this permit, the planning board didn't know about this permit. Very few folks knew about it. Per the ordinance, right. it was handled by the planning director. We have changed our central permitting software to where now if someone comes to the planning department and applies for a permit for any of these uses in the heavy industrial development ordinance, immediately, as soon as the application is filed into the software, uh, I get an email, Mr. Albright gets an email, we have IT, GIS, everyone uh, in county government that's remotely connected to this gets an email to say this has been filed, there is now a permit. In fact, I think just today we added the superintendent of the school system uh, to this because the schools had some interest in making sure they were aware if, uh, if something uh, heavy industrial was going right. right nearby. So the superintendent will also get an email. Then once, uh, if the permit is approved, a second email will be sent out. So I would be alerting the board. I would be calling you, emailing you to say there has been an application filed. Then through that period of review and uh, evaluation of the application, if at the end it's approved, that goes into the software system. Everybody gets another email. I would be letting everybody know, okay, the project at such and such has been approved. And also, uh, I want to let make sure the board knows <coughs> and the public that uh, you can currently go on the county's uh, GIS system and see where all the approved, unbuilt 
heavy industrial development uh, apps are at in county in, around the county. And there's also a, a little more user friendly, uh, non GIS based map available on the county planning department's website. So we hope those uh, are ways that uh, we can make sure that folks stay informed per the ordinance. This is all within compliance with the ordinance. So. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them, but my plan is to come back on the 22nd with more information about uh, the ordinance itself. So. I hear you say that you, everybody would be notified if the application was made. I thought I heard you say if the permit was granted. There'll be two emails. So when the, when the let's say a developer comes in to planning and wants to file today to start a, uh, a new court. As there's a process the planning okay. department puts, as soon as it's entered in, because it's entered in right then into the software, an email is sent out automatically as soon as it so is. So a permit granted. wouldn't be granted. Either. Permit's not yeah, granted, but everybody right. gets a notice. <laughs> then, uh -huh. then the second email goes out if the permit is granted. If the permit, if they're found to be compliant, it's okay to grant the permit. Everybody gets a second email. So, and again, my uh, function would be to make sure the board knows there has been a permit applied for by Brian Hagan to do a whatever the permit was for. So. I, I've got a question. I don't even know if this is possible since we do not do zoning. You know, the municipalities, if they're going to rezone a property, they put the notification around the property basically to the, let the neighborhood know we're considering to doing something with this property. Is, is that something we can even do? I mean, that was discussed at the planning board meeting. There were, you know, uh, some ideas thrown around by the planning board about posting notices, making that part of the ordinance where surrounding uh, there would be something posted at the property or surrounding property owners would get a letter. Or, so I, I couldn't speak to the legality of those things. I yeah, think they, the, they can change the ordinance. They recommended the change in 2011 from the high impact land use order. Right. And if they see fit, they can bring any changes to this board for approval. You know, I think that gives community notification. Hey, we're thinking about granting something here that. In fact, they, I they believe be in. the ordinance says it passed. Uh, you're supposed to put the the development on the Register of Deeds website, hmm. but we never. Yeah, but if I drive by a property and see a right. particular yellow what, sign what out, you, I know something's. What you're talking about generally is done in, in rezoning. So right. Other other counties that have zoning, you get the big yellow sign yeah. with the notice on. I think I can speak to that too since I was at the planning board meeting because okay. I'm the commissioner who goes to that. But um, the planning board, I think, was unanimous in saying yes, there should be a notification requirement. But they really didn't get into a discussion of what they would recommend to this board that that notification requirement should actually look like. And so I think that's why um, it's a good idea for them to have another crack at it before we come back on the 22nd so that. Um, they can maybe flesh that out for us a little bit more. And you can see the map, uh, Bruce has it pulled up on the, uh, on the screen there. So this is the map that's available on the county planning department's website. And it shows uh, the locations of uh, approved heavy industrial uh, development permit permits that have not been built yet. Because there, there are some out there that were approved and haven't been built. So right. this uh, this map, and it's also on the county's GIS website. It's a default layer. So if you go to the county's GIS, they're automatically up and on. You have to actually take action to turn them off. So. And um, I was at, um, Commissioner Carter and I were at our ethics training last week, and I had the opportunity to talk to a commissioner from Lee County, and they had I don't know if y'all remember before they built 40 to get to the beach you used to ride down 87 south mm -hmm. and in lee county there's carolina trace is that nice um development that's on the left as you're headed south the golf course and stuff they have a rock quarry that's going in that's got applied for a special use permit really close to there so i would like for us to look at include in our list of counties that we um look at how they do things look at lee county and maybe some um context of what's happened there in the last few months since they've been through a similar ordeal with um also people very very upset results there um but that was a special use permit that they were requesting not just a ordinance like we have so obviously when we compare to other counties we're going to see other counties do different things so i would like for that to be included please i, I was thinking yeah. that was one of the counties we went to back in developing. They have countywide zoning, yeah. 
as does Guilford. And the board, I don't know if you know it, but the uh, rock quarry that was proposed for Pleasant Garden in Guilford County was not approved by the planning board or the commissioner last well, I November. A, I think that's an interesting point that just because you have countywide zoning doesn't necessarily you know, it, yeah. erase the situation that's where right. you have a, some a unusual use coming into a nice residential area. So. That's correct. Well, what would our options be had we learned of this before it got approved by the state? Well, the ordinance as it is written is a spacing ordinance. The planning board in 2011 had about eight or nine months of meetings with citizens. And I mean, they met with everyone, the environmentalists, the real estate folks, the builders, landowners, farmers. And they decided the best way to handle this was the spacing requirement. And they set it up in tiers mm -hmm. based on the industry classification. And acreage right. involved. And our ordinance, the Heavy Industry Development Ordinance, if you go and just read it, it's only 17 pages. It actually mention, mentions hog farms. Hmm. So, <laughs> limiting to 250 hogs, though. But I find that interesting that <clears throat> that was the system that the citizens put together and, and then brought to the board and the board approved that spacing system um, and maybe and you know it could be changed it's a local law and you folks can change local laws but as for the permit that's been approved already i don't think you can change that can't backtrack <laughs> that's all all right, thank you. Um, do any of the other commissioners have <coughs> comments? I do. Um, Y'all don't. I'll do last. Um, first, uh, working on our committee assignments now with Commissioner Carter being here, he has uh, a list of the committees and the assignments if anybody else wants to review that, and that's available. I was asked to uh, remind everybody that the Piedmont Triad Regional Council, is that what it stands for? PTRC 50th anniversary celebration is in Alamance County on January 30th mm -hmm. at 8.30 in the morning. So, and I know I will be there. Um, I will too. Very quickly, I thought it would be, this is the last meeting of 2018. And I thought maybe we'd take a moment to think about what we have done as a county organization. First, we got the bonds ready to go on the ballot and there were um, time things that had to be timed out just right to get that work done. We didn't want to be the reason that the bonds didn't get on a ballot, and we weren't. Well, they were on the ballot, so that was well done. We did a budget in June. We had two elections. Um, there was a question we knew at the beginning of the year that 287G was going to come up and was going to be discussed, and it has been discussed. <laughs> and um, then there were things that at the beginning of the year that we didn't know we were going to deal with, like the MVP pipeline, and we spent a lot of time and energy thinking about that. Um, we had two hurricanes, a winter storm, I declared, or the county declared two states of emergency, <laughs> and now we've got a situation with the uh, quarry and looking at the high industrial development ordinance. <laughs> So next year, I think we know where we're going to be looking at with land use and things like that and getting our money's worth out of our planning director, bless her heart. And then the last thing I wanted to mention, and I have her permission to mention this, this is the last meeting for Susan Osborne. She has taken a job as the assistant secretary for the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services overseeing county operations. Congratulations. So. last day and I, I knew about this because I'm on the DSS board I'm the commissioner representative to that so the DSS board is actually by statute who has the duty to choose the new planning director so we will be working on that her last day is January 18th so this is her last commissioner meeting and um, we're just so happy for you and know that you're going to do great I don't know if you have to drive back and forth to Raleigh. Bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to stay during the week. Yeah. yeah leave at 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Right. Good luck with that. But um, <laughs> we will miss you very much. Yeah, thank you. And we wish you all the best. And thank you.
from the bottom of my heart for all your years of hard service to this county. And it's a blessing to know that other counties around the state are going to get the benefit of that wisdom and experience now. So thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And if there's no further business before the board, we'll be adjourned. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs>